coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show with special guest, legendary bass player extraordinaire, David Santos. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, everyone? How are you? This is another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you live from Crash Bar. Studio, Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm so excited today because I'm going to be joined by one of the world's greatest bass players. He's played for everyone from John Fogarty to Crosby, Stills, and Nash to... Fleetwood Mac, and he's currently on the road with Melissa Etheridge, my friend David Santos. Rich, how you doing? How are you, man? Yeah, excellent. It is so good to have you here. Great to be here. And you met Jim. He yeah, is man. My, good to have Jim. you on. Meet my, again. My nice co-host, my co-producer. He's always, you can always rely on yeah. him for a fast quip. We and, wanted you We wanted you to come over. Uh-huh. Oh, for the wine Melissa. party last night? Melissa, Melissa Etheridge. That's the Melissa. Oh, my God. Quick segue. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come on. Yeah, so, right. so you were just yeah. telling me that you have been, well, first of all, we've known each other about 20 years. We both based out of Nashville yeah. for about 20 years. That's right. Yeah. And uh, you have, oh, you're always gone. You're always working. Uh, I am. And you said you just got back for, from two months on the road with M Melissa Etheridge. Yeah, so we almost stayed out. We, we went to Europe in January, and we've been out, and we came home just for a few intermittent weeks. Yeah. Yeah, most of the time, gone. Gone. Yeah. What do you guys do on your off days? Do you, mm. do you, do you practice? Do you That's do clinics? Do you... uh, Melissa makes fun of me sometimes because I don't do anything. I usually stay in my room. Yeah? Yeah. So there's is she like, hey, we got a band outing. We're going out to Catalina. Sometimes. And you're like, I'm going to shed Dorian mode That's all day. Right. That's it. <laughs> Not Dorian mode, but I usually stay home. You know, stay in my room. Excuse yeah, yeah. Me. Yeah. Wow. And so that must yeah. be, you were out with um, with uh, one of my buddies from North Texas State, Brian Delaney, was yeah. playing drums. Oh, I love Brian. Yes. And you know what's so funny, and this speaks to kind of like the synchronicity of the day, mm. is that Brian played with, who's the guy that did Hot, 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 sh da, sh da, da, oh, da, uh, David uh, Joe Hansen. Hansen, you're right. He was in New York, New York Dolls. He, he was actually in the Dolls. He was uh, in uh, the Dolls. Brian was, yeah. I thought that was Buster Poindexter. He, that's right. Same right. guy. Same guy. He had a pseudonym sort of... Oh, really? Mm. Yes. I did not know that. And he was an actor, too. Or I'm, still a, I'm a radio guy. I should know these yeah, things. And he's cool. Yeah, he's cool. really great guy. Super small world. So I got some yeah. I got some notes on you. Listen to this, boys and girls. Billy Joel, Elton John, John Fogarty, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, the Dang. Neville brothers. Yeah. You were the band leader for Billy cool. Preston. Yeah. Steve Cropper. Yes. Um, and then, of course, Faith Hill in the studio. Billy Joel, Cindy Blackman, Kirk Whalen, Bob Seger, Keith Urban, Moran. Randall Lambert, Brad Paisley, a bunch mm. of slackers. A lot of people. A yeah. lot of people. You know, wow. you look back in your life and you go, wow, this is a body of work. I'm leaving a legacy. Mm. What, now, looking mm -hmm. back, what do you say to yourself? Like, wow, I did it. I achieved my childhood dreams. That's a great question. You know, yeah, like. Really great question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the childhood dreams is high up on the list. Right. I would say number one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because uh, I return to that thought regularly mm -hmm. is this what i wanted to do well, i didn't really want to do that anyway you know when i was a kid i didn't really want to do that so yeah i'm good <laughs> 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 well because i did a little research on you and you are from florida tampa you're from tampa yeah hey, you got family down there now with the storm and all mom, that yeah mom and kids but the, i think the storm missed us i think we're good okay it's kind of veering its way up the coast now i think oh good it's, ta good it's taking a right I hope everyone's home. okay out there. Yeah, because yeah, my all. folks are in Fort Myers, Port Charlotte area, which is the west side. Okay, My yeah. mom was just texting me, so hopefully they're at a family reunion in Connecticut. So, Oh, oh there you go. Uh, they're fine. They should be fine, except they hate each other already. <laughs> 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 Kidding. Sorry. So you had three Joke. brothers, right? Yes. Three brothers, two of which were musical. That's right. And then one brother that was the black sheep. Yeah, he was the older brother, and he liked, you know, uh, sort of technical things. He became an engineer. Yeah. Who's the smart one? Is was it us or him? It definitely wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> so, know, so one brother played guitar. Yeah, they both played. Two brothers. They were guitar players, and they had a little band. And uh, should, should I launch into a story about? Oh God, that? please, yeah. yeah. And uh, and they were in the room playing Jimi Hendrix and Beatles and uh, you know all the stuff of the, of the day. We're talking in the seventies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a little older than you. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> no. And and they uh, the bass player couldn't do it anymore 
he didn't want to do it anymore. He had an old Epiphone bass sitting there and a little amp, and and I didn't I couldn't play a note. You know, I didn't know anything. They were good, really good. They yeah. played Foxy Lady and all that stuff, and I'd be like, Wow, well, down, down, ka doom, boom, boom, doom. <laughs> <laughs> Jim's a drummer, so yeah. when you speak nice. music, he's like, "I got it." Oh, and he's really? younger. He's younger than us. Typically, with a drummer, we don't get music. <laughs> Typically, with a drummer, they don't get it. Right. Oh, that's terrible. But no. So then I went in and said, "Can I play?" When he left, and yeah. the rest is history. And you just started pecking, pecking yeah. notes. Ran to the next bedroom when, when you know, like. Uh, Oh, it's supposed to sound like sort of that. Okay, hold on. I ran, found it, and then come back in and play it. That's cool. See, that makes me think that deep down, that was your calling. You, you, so. and you were you lucky. You were lucky enough so. to find it young. How old were you? Gosh, that was 14, 13, 14, 15, Those oh. those days, you know. Yeah, high school. Yep. And then you ended up going to Boston. Yes, for uh, to learn to read music. Mm -hmm. I couldn't read music at all. Well, I love your story because um, our Base Frontiers magazine. I did. Uh, there's a video floating uh, out there. It's yeah. a great, a great interview, and it talks about your desire to Dave learn Fowler. to read music. Dave Fowler, buddy, Dave Fowler. Um, because you know, in my teaching, that's I come across that all the time. Like people that have a great feel, they have natural instincts, but when you are limited by the inability to read music, your choices are far less, and you can create far less opportunities for yourself. You said to yourself. I want to move to New York, and to do that, I am going to have to learn how to read music. Yes, that's exactly right. Yes. And then- Perfectly put. When you got to Berkeley, you said, man, I don't want to learn arranging. <laughs> I don't need a degree in music. You said, I just want to become an expert at reading music. Who that's was, right. Who was the gentleman that said, I got you, kid? Tell that story. Oh, man, there was a lot of that. You, so, uh, okay, so Berkeley- all right. Well, I knew Andy Newmark. The drummer from Roxy Music. He, yes, and others. Sly Stone. Yes. Uh, you know, legend. He's kind of funky. John Lennon. Yeah. Where does he live? He's up in Connecticut, isn't he? No, he lives in London. Oh, wow. And he hasn't really played that much, although he did come to Nashville about two months ago when I was home for a few days at mm. the uh, City Winery with Nils Lofgren, and it was amazing. Wow, okay. He sounded as great as he ever has. I would have loved to have seen that because my- oh. My old next door neighbor was childhood friends with Andy Newmark. What's his name? Uh, George Pinger, and he moved to Florida. He retired and he sold the house, but okay. he was great because when I was on the road all the time for about a seven year period, he would keep an eye on my cat and the house mm -hmm. and my ex-wife and he was a good neighbor. So you're not on the road that much? I'm still on the road a lot, but I ended up moving to, um, got divorced and I ended up moving to Midtown Nashville and I live right next to Omni Studios. Oh, you're right, right. So I can go sure. to, I can just kind of crawl to all the cool things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Division Street? Emphasis on crawl. Yeah, crawl. I wanted to have something once in my life that came close to like living in the East Village where I could walk to everything, you yeah. know? yes. I so I know. treated myself to that. So Andy Newmark. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, see, I was in this band in Vegas. You want to know about Andy Newmark? Yeah. All right. uh, Anything you want to talk about. Yeah. This is your show, baby. Uh, Andy Newmark is, uh, I'd love to talk about Andy Newmark. God, he's a big part of my life. And I mean, he's a great drummer. Yeah. Uh, I was in Vegas and I was playing uh, with a show band, living in a house, struggling. You know, it was rough. Yeah. Vegas. What time period was this? This was in 1980. Okay. 7980. Right on. And uh, at that time, there was some problems. There were problems with, with me and, uh, you know, being like sort of uh, youthful and there's girls around and all oh, that. Yeah. yeah. That's so, not a problem. <laughs> that's, 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 called, par, that's called character building. That's par for the course. That's yeah. why we get into music. That's right. <laughs> exactly. That's why I got into radio. It didn't work <laughs> out that way, though. Jim, Jim has 26 years in radio. I got into radio oh, really? for the money. Whoa. I don't think the groupies are the same for you as they would for, be for David There Santos. were no groupies. You had to be on a morning oh. show. <laughs> Where are they now? No, I'm kidding, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody here. Uh, <laughs> Vegas, that time period, was a great time to invest in Vegas. Yeah. My well, gosh. yeah. I've been, yes. People have asked me if I wanted to get into real estate. Oh. Actually. Yeah. It would have been beautiful at that point. Man, I'd be rich. I'd be off the road now. Yeah. <laughs> not, that's not negative. Is, is the road getting a little weary? Uh, 
No, I, mean, I love the road. I mean, I mean, I like traveling too. It's interesting because you know you're you're playing in a modern rock band, and so your travels take you to the seven continents. Like mm. you know the 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 situation that I'm in, nothing but gratitude, and I get to travel the world with my best friends. But we just hit this 48 states over and over and over and over. So I go, okay, yeah, it's like uh, Indiana, Verizon Amphitheater, caterings on the left, my dressing rooms on the right. Oh, we, you see. know, it's like it's like every year, mm-hmm. you know, that thing. You've gotten used to it. It's used, yeah. You know every every room. You yeah. know every yeah. I got it. Yeah, that's why when you said, what do you do on your days off? I sort of, I've already done it all. Sort yeah, of, yeah. Right? I've already been to that. What are those four guys? Mount Rushmore. <laughs> <laughs> I still have not seen that. I still have not seen really? the Grand Canyon. <laughs> what? No. Well, because everyone says, oh, come on. Says, dude, you're going, you travel for a living. But yeah, you know what I see? I see a backstage area yeah. with sweaty cheese. Yeah. Yeah, and but don't you, I mean, you, cheese. what time do you, t- you guys typically get into the venue? Uh, you know, well, I would think that with somebody like Melissa and a lot of the acts that you've oh. been touring with, you you guys base out of a hotel room, and yes. then and then you may or depending on the quality of your crew, and then what the Great artist crew. is, sometimes you will sound check with artists, and sometimes you don't. You just go play the show. I've yeah. always in ban- been in bands where we sound check, so that breaks you up gotta, the day. You got to stick around. The you got to go do the sound check. Yeah, right. so that leaves Every you like day. the morning to play with. So you can teach. You can go do a little sightseeing. Seeing, I might go do a drum clinic and you know, start to thinking. I was started thinking of the days in terms of of hours. Mm. Like mm-hmm. there's so many yeah. hours here. Oh, yeah. How can I fill these things up okay. and be productive? Four hours. Yeah. 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 And, and that intermittent sleep is rough on the bus. Then you pull in. Yeah. Then you get your stuff. Go to the room. Yeah. Could be three in the morning. Could be five in the morning. You drag it in. Uh, where am I going? Where's the elevators that way? Okay. Get into the room. Uh, fix the. Make sure the light doesn't come in. And yeah. Sit around. Where are the inputs and the outputs? And where's my computer going to go? Oh shoot! I've got exactly four hours. Uh, uh, Steven's going to pick us up downstairs at three. Okay. Okay. And and mm-hmm. boom. Then you just focus there. So I, I don't go around. Some people do. They go to the city and they want to yeah. say, Hey, I want to see where I can go buy. Sometimes I'll go to a bookstore. Yeah. Oh, nice. Now, yeah, like, do you have the option like of a Barnes staying and on Noble the bus? Or, uh, uh, any, I like used bookstores, actually. Okay. Oh, yeah. So a local flavor bookstore. That's right. I got you. That's, I'll go down to the front desk or I use my phone these days and say, I walk out and I say, take me to the closest used bookstore. And then Siri you know, does this little thing and says, walk five miles this way. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, Newmark. Newmark. So I'm in Vegas, and uh, I had a, a some about five or six of my favorite cassettes with Andy playing drums, and they were George Benson records, Bob James records. Mm-hmm. These were CTI records. CTI was a CTI fanatic. CTI was a label. Creed Taylor. This was uh, fusion before fusion. It was funky jazz. Funky jazz. Yeah, it was before it became like, you know, uh, I guess the fusion was around. Weather Report was around. Jocko had just kind of hit. This was 77, 78, 79. And I had these uh, with me, and and Andy Newmark was playing drums. So I'm in this band, and the oldest guy in the band, Tony LaRocca, God rest his soul, one of the greatest musicians I've ever met. Uh, Wasn't famous, but just taught me more than you would ever imagine. And Andy said the same thing, uh, because he knew him. He said, oh, Andy Newmark? I said, yeah, man, he's a bad drummer. He said, I used to work with Andy. And I went, get out of here. You don't really, yeah, no, I'm, I'm serious. As a matter of fact, I've got his number. And he gave it to me. Yeah. I called him up cold and the phone rings. And he's like, hello. I don't know if you've ever met Andy. He's very dry. No. Hmm. He's like, hello. And I said, uh, is this Andy Newmark? You know, green. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yes. And I said, uh, uh, Tony LaRocca uh, gave me your number and I uh, I really want to uh, uh, talk to you. And he's like, so? <laughs> wow. <laughs> that really nice. Super wind out of your sails. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm like, uh, well, I'm sorry to bother you. And he was like, well, I mean, what? What do you want to know, man? And I said, okay, I want to move to New York and blah, blah, blah. Well, he gave me his uh, permission to call. And then I returned. I didn't, Vegas didn't work out, as I told you about the girls and everything. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't girls. It was all kind of other stuff. But yeah, the, I was just explaining the youth of my, you know. The well, you got through it. Craziness, yes. Character yeah. building. Character building. Moved back to Tampa. Got to Tampa. Continued to call Andy. Yeah. He became my lifeline. He was off in New York somewhere. Yeah. And every record that would come out, I'd buy it. And you mentioned Roxy Music. Unbelievable. Yeah. That Avalon record goes down in the top five. Oh, that's your top of, five. Oh, wow. Yeah. Definitely. Top two or three. And I gave it to Cindy Blackman one time to listen to on the road. 
But anyway, and so I called him and called him, and then my father got sick, and it was getting into this thing where I'm like, oh, man, I got to leave. I got I to gotta go somewhere. I can't really keep playing these bars. So I've got to move to New York. So Andy, so I'd call him, and he'd say, you got to learn to read, man. You got to learn to read. Like, read? Like, really read? Yeah, like, really read. Yeah. I mean, like, put a chart in front of you and play it first time yeah so for a lot of folks out there that are listening there's a lot of there's a lot of musicians in the world that play by feel they don't know how to read music here in nashville we kind of like have a hybridized style called the nashville number chart which is not real reading in the sense that if you're going to do a film track or a, a new york jingle date or play with a symphony orchestra there's a lot of black on the page because every note that the musician plays or is expected to play is written out note for note and you have to be able to read that in real time oh yeah and so that's what he was referring to that's right yeah you better you don't come here if you don't know how to read so you couldn't do charts or anything or anything shorthand no, nothing. it had to be legit the real thing yeah you had to read that takes years of discipline that's right yeah and that's why berkeley and I, yeah. and he said man maybe you should uh before you move here really get some stuff together now my father was still alive, right. and he said, uh, well, you want to learn to read music? Well, maybe we'll check you know, out uh, uh, L.A., because there's a school called uh, MIT out there. It was BIT at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I flew out there. Jeff Berlin was the guy. who yeah. He lives here now. Jeff Berlin moved here. Plays at Rudy's Jazz Club all the time, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So just for, for perspective of the youngins listening, yeah. you didn't go to YouTube and and just you know find a, a no it was a, a virtual course <laughs> right right I did I flew to L A and when I got there it, it wasn't what I had hoped so I turned around and flew back home and said it's going to be Berkeley and then I'll straight up to Berkeley hit Berkeley for a little while work on my reading that's what you referenced earlier then move to New York and Andy and I maybe we'll have a friendship maybe we won't uh, but if not I'll be able to read and he's told me that so I just followed his pointers it's great learn to read and I did. I went to Berkeley when I got there uh, to continue on the path of what you said. Uh, the, you, your question was, who was it at Berkeley? Yeah. Got you guided in the right direction. Well, I went there. As I you know, checked in, there was a guy that was uh, Jeff Link. He was uh, he had seen me play in a jazz club many years earlier right. in Tampa. And he remembered the bass I played and everything. It was kind of cool. And, uh, and he said, I'll get you a scholarship maybe. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. So he said, go in that room over there and talk to the... The uh, bass guy, Mr. Rich Appleman, and I went in there. They gave me a lot of things to study. Listening and analysis, arranging one, uh, ear training this, you know, this and that. And I looked at it all and I went, great, thank you very much. And I went back to the other office and said, I don't want to take any of this. Yeah. He said, but you're at Berkeley College of Music. I mean, that's what we, that's why you're here. Right. And I said, I don't, I, nothing. None of this. That's amazing self awareness because I'm. I went to the traditional college and had to do the whole listening and analysis and all. I did all that for like seven years and like played legit percussion and did. You were like, Great. I want to read music. I just want to learn this one thing, so That's I can right. go to New York. That's right. gosh, man, you guys are nailing it. And I said, he said, well, you know, we don't. The bass man and I loved him because I later made great friends with him. <clears throat> yeah, uh, he said. We don't do that here. That's not what this is. This is Berkeley College of Music. And at that time, it was, it's the best college in the world. Mm -hmm. you, for music. Gonna, yeah. yeah, for music. You're going to come here and do this if you're going to be here. And I said, no, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to move yeah. to New York. I'm paying you, okay? <laughs> Let me well, tell you what I'm going to learn. Hey. I want to pay you. That's right. To teach me how to read friggin' music, all right? Don't you tell me about being well-rounded. Oh, man, is that how I came across? <laughs> oh, man. Mr. Appleman, I'm sorry. I want to take it back. Well, you weren't paying him yet, and they were going to give you a little bit of a break, a little bit of a scholarship. That's right. But then he said- <laughs> What's on your a la carte menu? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe if I didn't- <laughs> Okay. Can I just order from paid. the appetizers? <laughs> so for two years, you learned how to read music, and you said, I'm ready. Two years. It wasn't two years. It only went, it lasted about, uh, this is great. I'm glad I'm reliving this. This is great. <laughs> this is, it wasn't two years. It was only about six to eight months. Okay. And I met Matt Rawlings on the first day. Mm -hmm. we, we were in an amazing big band. I think it might have been the Buddy Rich big band, but it was a huge band with all these horns. <laughs> Matt was playing, and the drummer was Ben Porowski. Oh, yeah. He was a very good drummer. Right. We were, we were the, now, man, mind you, I was 27 yeah. already, and these guys were 18, you know, whatever. I was about to ask you, yeah, because usually college age, you're like 18, and you're all deer in the headlights, oh and you want to make the those four years count for the rest of your life. Yeah. But you were like, look it, I'm already 27. I got to get this skill set together. Let's, Let's go. Let's do this. And right. I got a guy named Andy Newmark in New York right. who's playing with on the new David Sanborn record. 
which by the way, there's a great story there. While I was at Berkeley, he called me up and he said, David, it's Andy. I said, hey, he said, uh, David Sanborn is looking for a bass player. Uh, Marcus Miller is leaving the band and uh, I believe that you'd be good in the band. And I said, really? And he said, yes, uh, you, you need to go to SIR on uh, 52nd Street and uh, tell them I sent you. Uh, but I'm in Boston? He said, yes, you need to get a flight. <laughs> and get you know, very dry. <laughs> Super dry. Yeah. Now, did he be end, end up becoming a closer ally and friend Very at some good point? friends. Okay. Very good friends. He said, this is a toothbrush moment. You just bring your toothbrush and go to this SIR and, I, and your base. I said, yes. So I jumped on the plane. You know, my, my uh, friend drove me. Got there. Cabbed over. SIR. SIR. There it is. Okay. Jumped out. Knocked on the door. This dude came out and he had a clipboard. He says, yes, how can I help you? I said, uh, uh, Andy Newmark sent me. And he was like, <laughs> no, you're not on the list. Mm-hmm. They were in there rocking out hard. Yeah. Dennis Chambers was playing drums. Actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, they had, uh, so he says. That's uh, not intimidating. Mm, he goes, uh, uh, you're not on the list. Boom, door closed. Oh. And says, this is a podcast, so I'm telling stories that might inspire some young totally. guys. Totally. So I knock, boom, boom, boom again. I had just flown in. And Andy Newmark told me to, for God's sake. So. He goes, the guy comes back annoyed. What? And I said, well. Uh, annoyed in New York? Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> can you tell David Sanborn that uh, uh, Andy Newmark's friend David Santos is here? So Sanborn comes out. Nice. Because Andy's a great drummer, man. You know, you don't mess around. I mean, if he said, to listen to this guy, he put his horn down. He came out. Nice guy, David. I loved his music. So I really enjoyed that period oh. of of it's pre it was like pre smooth jazz. Yes, and he was like led the pack with his tone and his style. David Sanborn still playing, right? Still playing. Yeah, great, better than ever. Yeah, he comes out and he looks at me, and I'm just standing there like I I want to play. And he said, uh, "David," he laughed. He said, let, "Let me explain what this is. I don't know what Andy was talking about because these are teams." Well, it turns out Andy had done a session that morning with him, mm-hmm. and he had mentioned he was looking for a bass player and drummer casually, and then he remembered me and wanted to help me. But he said these are teams that have been back three or four times. This is a, you know Dennis Chambers and I forget the guy's name. He's a great bass player from Chicago. Yeah. Anyway, these two, two, these two, these two, these two, they're all sitting in chairs in there, and he says, you know, I, I they, this is the third callback. I says, I'm going to make my decision today. And I was like, they've, they've had the music. They've been here three times, and today I'm going to decide. And they're here for the final run through. Wow! You, you, you don't. What are you going to play? I said, sit me down, and I'll show you. <laughs> That's exactly what That's I right. said. I'll come in, sit down, and I'll watch somebody play if they don't mind, and then I'll jump up on stage and play. How's that? And, wow! And he smiled, like the confidence. He said, "Come on in." He sat me down in this chair. He says, "Everybody." This guy is going to watch you play and come up and play. <laughs> you know, one of those things. So I watched this tune as Hiram Bullock was playing guitar. Ricky Peterson is with Fleetwood Mac and yeah. you know, all these great musicians. Heavies. Heavies in his band at the time. I love that he had a triple callback. Yeah, he, he wanted a good team, you know. Yeah. He was, he was hot at the time. David was doing great stuff. This, this story's got like a right hook coming, I feel. He like. says, okay, uh, come on, uh, you ready? You know, I said, yeah, yeah. I jump up on stage. They didn't want to be there. You know, they were already tired, right? All the guys that were going to still play right there. Right. I remember, okay, well, let's just get play, whatever. So I, I jumped up there, and, and I, it was a bass line. Doom, 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 doom. I remember it. Doom, 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 doom. But it was in the wrong key. I thought it was in A. It was in A flat. I started playing in A. Oh, no. And they were looking at me like, well, are you out of your mind? And then, of course, when, when they came in, it was obvious. Oh, no. And then Sam were turning around, and he was just like, uh, a flat. I went, oh, Thought Pardon it was a. try it again. Excuse me. That's yeah, right. he recorded me though. He had a little dat man in those days. Yeah, yeah. And he did, recorded. Did you, did you at point, that point say, "Yeah, I know it's an A because it <laughs> should be an A." You guys are wrong. Yeah, I was That's that confident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you get to do the whole song That's again crazy. in the right key? Three times. All right. He and that was the greatest feeling because he finished it. And they were all like, "Wow, that was pretty good." I was kind of grooving, you know. And he goes, I, I already had whatever it is that I have now, right? We all have it. Yeah, it's in us. Yeah, it's in us. And Andy told me that once. You know, we all play one song. 
We play one song. That's wow. What we do. That's profound. Yeah. What very, do you mean? He's by a that? very profound guy. We play one. song. We all play one song. Uh, it's uh, you. Your in your innate uh, heartbeat and rhythm and uh, what you would want to play comes through every time. The way I'm speaking to you right now is me. You can tell it's me. I don't speak mm-hmm. like anyone else, right? Okay. I play the same way. You let the song come to you. Yeah, you kind of, you kind of, you have to master what the song structure is and the way it is written and, and honor it and honor the notes and, and do that. But then you embellish and you kind of like groove your thing to it. Right? And, and I would like to say that I'm being profound right now, but I'm not. I watched The Legend of Bagger Vance the other day. You ever see that movie with oh. Will Smith? Oh yeah, Matt yeah, Damon. the golf movie. Yeah. yeah, and the whole thing is about you got to let your you got to find you, you lost your swing, man. Mm. You got to let your swing. Every man's got uh-huh. his own his, his swing, their own swing, his song, and you got to let your your swing find you. Every hole has got its own swing. That's in harmony with the birds, with the turning of the earth. With what time of day it is. That's right. I mean, it's like a spiritual type of speech. Oh, yeah. Nice. You know, and it's true because, I mean, when you do have that little spiritual moment when you're grooving on a song, it just feels right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. You nailed it. Yeah. And, and he was, that's what Andy said. So I played it like me. And they he picked up on that and he, he turned around. I thought he was going to kick me off the stage and I was going <laughs> to get on the plane. Right? But he, he said, let's do it again. And and the guys in the band went, yeah, let's do it again. And they nice. kind of started grooving. We did it again. They, he recorded it. That man was on a chair kind of behind him, so he had to actually make a physical move and go back and you know and stop and pause and talk and then let's do it again. You know, so he was actively involved in seeing who I was. He recorded it, we did it again, walked back and turned it off, and then he he was kinda like sort of I could see as the wheels were turning in his head now that I relive it, and, and he said, uh, let's do it again. I said, Let's do it again. So it wasn't really necessary wow. that you knew how to do it. Everybody was zoning together. Pretty much, and he right. want, he was here listening for that song, the universal song you're talking about. Right. He wasn't really listening to the notes at that point. He was listening to whether or not I would fit in. Of course, I didn't get the gig, so what's the next question? Well, that, but the, <laughs> but, Just kidding. But he, pro- he saw, I think That's he was joke. impressed with your moxie. And if you're 27 at the time, he had to be 40. Yeah. And That's and right. and and he's and once you start to get to that age and you have some notoriety and you have some success and some history under your belt, you start thinking about mentoring or creating breaks or opportunities for another generation. You should, I think. You know, I, maybe, I believe that. I mean, he there. was doing that. He was. Yeah. Here's the greatest thing. I went home. All you know, called Andy. Thank you, and then waited for the phone to ring, and it didn't. Mm-hmm. It didn't ring. Who ended up getting that job? No one called me. Steve Logan ended up playing bass. He mm-hmm. passed away. He's a great bass player. Wow. I actually got to know him a little. Uh, but what what happened, great, this is good for everybody that's listening because I went back, waited for the phone to ring. It didn't ring. I kept practicing, kept reading every day, did move to New York, started at the bottom, played the blues gigs, played every bar gig in New York City that you could possibly play. I was in five or six rehearsal bands, whatever it had to be. I got in a good band. It was a rock and roll band. Yeah. Very Rolling Stonesy band. Mm-hmm. It's very Rolling Stonesy, but the singer was he's unique. It was great. Steve Jordan heard it and wanted to produce it. This is before he was really producing. Yeah. And we had done a gig. Steve and I did a gig together and we hit it off. Mick Taylor was playing guitar it was of the Stones and uh, this harmonica legend named uh, Junior Wells was playing. It was a pretty high level blues gig and we did the gig. And he, he said, uh, yeah, I'll come hear you play. He heard the band. He said, I fucking love these guys. Mm. Uh, you guys are great. It was a raw rock and roll band. Yeah. Right? It was great. And he said, come to my house. So I go to his house, apartment. He's got a Ringo everywhere. Steve Jordan was yeah, into Ringo. Was totally into yeah. Ringo. He had a bathtub in the middle of his living room, which was one of these odd bathtubs, the, the old kind yeah. on legs. You know, yes. Full of like Beatle memorabilia. He had a real Ringo kit. Like It's kind of like this. He yeah, had a yeah. Ringo kit. Then he had all these uh, posters and very ring. I was like, man, I'm a Beatle fanatic too, man. Yeah. And we hit it off. We talked about Beatles. And then, uh, and so then, he, okay, here's the thing. He never produced the band. But here's the cool part. I had given him some cassettes and they weren't audible. He said, I need some better stuff than this. So go home and get me some better tapes. So I got the band together. We need tapes. This guy, Steve Jordan, is going to produce us. Steve said, come meet me at Electric Lady Studios. I'm recording. Give me those new tapes. I go there. Buzz. They buzz me in. I come down the steps, and I'm hearing this nasty funk coming out of this room. I got my cassettes. I just want to not bother anyone. Hand them to Steve Jordan and leave. I come down the steps. The doors are open. 
the guy Marcus Miller is playing, standing between two speakers, grooving, and like they're all. Omar Hakim was in there. I don't know why, because he wasn't playing. But Omar and, and and Jordan and a couple other guys and Dave. I didn't see David, but all these other guys went there recording. And there's and, but he's playing guitar, Marcus. Yeah, playing good funky guitar. Wow, white strat. Ding 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 funky. And I'm like Marcus Miller is playing guitar like that. Oh wow. So mm, I waited outside. Somebody said, "Hey, come in." I went in. Here, Steve. Here's the stuff. I won't bother you. I'm gonna go now. It was, they were dancing. It was unbelievable. It was very tribal, man. It was. They it was were, like they were dancing. They were recording, but <laughs> yes. they were. It was a party. A party. It was a funk party. You got it. A total funk party. And that studio <laughs> is now gone. It, is it? Is it? Is it, is, is it gone? I hope. It I'm, is. I'm just assuming. I haven't that, been back. I mean, power stations gone. Oh my right? god, I, that's a great question too. I hope it's. We have not to gone. find that out. We kind of had a funk party last night with uh, 1.3 bottles. Yeah, the of wine. wine party. Yeah. Well, as I left. I, I said, I, I said, <laughs> one point. Sorry. I go to leave. Hold on. And I'm walking out the door. Am I that's still for, recording? That, oh, yeah, me. you're recording. That's for his a, joke. As I walk out the door to leave, to exit this party, of which David Sanborn was not in it. Yes. I hear, Santos! Loud. I turn back around. What's that? And it, it was him. It was David Sanborn. And this had been a good... This is a good eight or nine years since I oh, met wow. him. Yeah. He remembered you. He remembered me. That's my point. Yeah. And I, I turned around. I looked. He was sitting behind the door. It was a David Sanborn session. Marcus was producing, playing guitar, bass, all these cats. That's probably why Omar was there. He probably played on a couple of tunes. Jordan was playing on most of the record. I know you know the record. It's a real funky record. It's yeah, James I, Brown tunes, grooves. Oh, it, it was. Snakes was snakes. one of the tunes. Yeah, the... Yeah, because that would have been that would have been like ninety three. Okay, there you go. Because I would I played all those songs in Dallas in a million working bands. Like after, during, and after the North Texas period. Like I was in school with like Delaney had just left. It was like me, Blair, um, and Carlock, and that we were all playing that stuff all around Dallas. Wow. Yeah. Dang, you know all those three guys. Yeah. From from those days, your college buddies are your your buddies for life. I know. That's yeah. the greatest thing. They all went to New York and L.A. and they're like, why are you moving to Nashville, Nashville Rich? Man. <laughs> I know. The first couple of years were rough. But, so you, um, so here you, we are. Great stuff, man. You played in and around New York. I did. That whole time. Uh, yep. And did struggling. Go, struggling. Stru well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a tough city. Oh, yeah. Um, how far north did you go? Did you get into like Danbury, Connecticut at all? Yeah. Did I'd you go up there? Sure. Tuxedos? Oh, Tuxedo yeah. Tuxedo Junction? Man, I did all the weddings and I, things. I played there. Did you? Tuxedo, Tuxedo Junction. Tuxedo Junction? Yeah. That was the big venue that yeah. we played at. Well, that's what's cool about that the tri-state cool. area. You can yeah. work, 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 work. Upstate New York. You know? yeah. yeah. And so uh, how long were you based in in New York City? <clears throat> uh, man, I was there until uh, 2000. Oh, wow. And I did the Live at the Garden uh, we, with um, Billy Joel. It's called the Millennium Concert. It was okay. a very good uh, thing to have on your your table, you know. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, I played it. It was a double album. Live with Billy Joel. That was that. Uh, what was that called? Y two K. Remember, it was yeah, changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. it was a big night. It was like, oh man, what's going to happen at midnight? And that yeah. was with Lib, right? Our buddy Lib. Liberty Devito, who taught at my camp. One of my, my best friends. Yes, yes, he speaks yeah. highly of you. By the oh, way, he, he's, he's how could he not? Oh, we had so right. much fun together. He speaks kind of lowly of you too. Yeah. So, so you play with Billy Joel? I, I mean, did. Is he a pretty demanding guy <clears throat> to play to play for? Man. I mean, he seems very particular. He's he's kind of <clears throat> particular, uh, not like Bill, like somebody like John Fogerty, but but he's very he, he's loose enough. It right, was, it was relaxed. John's very very picky. Fogerty is very, very microcosmic. Very. Oh huh. my goodness! What was I the record that you and Kenny him. recorded together? In? Four of them. We did four of That's John right. Fogerty records, mm -hmm. and most of them were recorded in Los Angeles. Yeah, all. Did you ever base in Los Angeles? I moved to L.A. when I was with Crosby, Stills, and Nash because I felt like it was a smart thing to be out there. Yeah. And uh, it was great. I loved it. And Wendy and I moved out there. And uh, then after two years of paying rent, we decided, <laughs> wait a minute. We don't really need to be paying rent. The look rent. says it all. Right. <laughs> like, Why are we paying $2,500 a month to live in an apartment? We should be putting that into a mortgage or something. Yes. Moved to Nashville. Mm-hmm. Now, Wendy is a session singer as well, yeah. right? And you guys have been together a long time. 26 years. I love She's my it. my soulmate. That's beautiful. Wow, very cool. 
Best friend in the world. Great singer. We're going to see her tonight. You guys should come. Where, what, what's happening? She's playing at the uh, Third and Lindsley. For we love you. Third and Lindsley. Yeah. Yep, yep. With the Time Jumpers, she's a full fledged member of the Time Jumpers. Wow, great band. Yeah, great. Mm. Vince Gill is with her. They used it's, to play at that little joint down in the Gulch. Um, yes, I've forgotten the Station name of it. Inn. Station Inn. And now Third and Lindsley. Yeah, they have a regular uh, as a residency. Uh, Vince plays guitar. Vince produced her new album, beautiful, which is amazing, and there's great musicians on that. Fred Eltringham played drums. Yeah, we love all Fred. All drummers. Yeah, I'm sure you've... Fred's in the scene. We never cross paths. He's currently on the road with Sheryl Crow. Yes. But you know, like, you you have, you have respect all these peers that you have, and you try to run into them and keep up with as many as you can, but like, I never run into Fred. Yeah. Family man. Yeah. You know, busy. You have kids and stuff? No, I never... I tried marriage twice, and um, I never had kids. Jim? I do, three. Three? Yep. Really? Here in town? Yeah, it's Spring Hill. Yeah, we it's uh, beautiful. We just had a bout this morning with uh, Rich. Stayed over last night, and we, uh, you know, hung out. And uh, my son's a drummer, and it's funny he's got this world class drummer at his disposal <laughs> in the living room. We're trying to sell his first kit, his first drum kit, so he can move on up. And he's in school band, fighting us tooth and nail every bit of the way. And uh, so he's, he's playing his, you know, Rich sits down at his his kit and starts playing. He's like, "Hey, why don't you come over?" And, and Spencer, you know. He looks up from his phone and looks Spencer. back down on his phone. He never even looked up. Um, he didn't? <laughs> never. Oh well, they're gosh. always on their phones. We lit him up after you left, man. Well, I tried. But it's like, dude, you got to, you know, it's like, you got well, look what you have here for crying out they, loud. They don't know it until it's too late. Oh. Kids. You're too familiar. Youth. Oh. You've become Uncle Youth. Rich. Uncle Rich. I'm Uncle yeah. Rich for everyone. That's okay. I try to be a good yeah. uncle. I try to be a good uncle. You're a great a good uncle. Word. Rich is a good word, too. And and it's, you know, he comes in and we got the xylophone set up that uh. we got, we're paying for now. And, uh, you know, Spencer's starting to get it. I, it it's, it's one of those things Spencer. like when you tell your wife that she's beautiful, right? Mm. It doesn't matter until she gets hit on at the grocery store. So... My kids, as long as I am the guy telling them, no, you got to, you know, do all the rudiments and I can teach you this stuff. Yeah, dad, what do you know? Right. You know, until he gets into the school band and he surrounds himself with the culture and the people and all of a sudden he's going to have a whole- Where's that Rich Redmond guy? Right. Yeah, Where's learned, Uncle Rich? He learned on the xylophone. He, he learned uh, the John Carpenter. Halloween. Yeah. And I said, <clears throat> and I started jamming with him. I said, Spencer, it's in five. Come on, man. It, yeah. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Just like a little brat. Yeah. Dang. <laughs> I got I mean, a picture at the end of that. And it's just like, dude, you've got, I would have killed to have this coming up uh, when oh, I yeah. started playing. Definitely. Because I used to go down, I lived in I'm Connecticut. You. So, right. you know, if uh, we ever got the chance. Outside of New York. So you're probably, and we brought this up in another episode, you might be well aware of the East Coast Music Mall. <clears throat> no. Not at all. Don't okay. remember that. It was a store in Connecticut. Mm. That was a, it was a mall, and that's what it branded as, and, and they put it out all the different trades and stuff like that in magazines, and it was like a guitar player's heaven. Okay, you'd walk in. The guy who owned it was named uh, Ed Roman. So, But that was our local music store growing up, and for a drummer, it wasn't much. And those are all disappearing. Mom and Pop music stores mm -hmm. are disappearing. Oh, yeah. oh, this this oh, dude yeah. was, I mean, he was like a notch below Sam Ash and Guitar Center. He wanted to go big, yeah. but it just never happened. So whenever we had the opportunity to go to White Plains, Sam Ash was down oh, there. Oh, White Plains. For sure. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It was like a paradise. Yeah, drums in there. Oh, yeah. And you could play them. Yeah. And we had the Long Island Drum Center in Nyack. Yes. That was, uh, we could sit there. You could actually play the-, the Yeah, East I've been there. I've been yeah. there. Yep. You, couldn't, you couldn't do that at the East Coast Music Mall. The Music Mall didn't yeah. have it. It was guitar. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that, to have that kind of influence, like a rich Redmond in your life to to, to mentor you and nurture you, my kid's oh. like, eh. Oh, man, I would have killed to have some, <clears throat> right? some, some, some Alex Van Halen. Oh, yeah, my first right? heroes were um, Stuart Copeland and and uh, Alex nice. Van Halen and uh, nice. Carmine Apice. Uh, and then I went I'll back. I work with him. Go yeah, ahead. Carmine, I love Carmine. <laughs> and then, hey, let me introduce you to my new tits. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's really funny you can beep because that, right? I mean, I grew up 
from 11 to 18 in El Paso, Texas. And it's kind nice. of, it's kind of like a, it's a very multicultural city, but not a lot comes through there. So Buddy Rich came through, the Maynard Ferguson big band came through. Oh, big band um, stuff, sure. After Vanilla Fudge and I Rod heard Stewart. that about you, that you were a great big band drummer. I had heard this about oh, you. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, when I first moved to Nashville, I played in, there's a collection jazz orchestra and there was a, uh, um, the Nashville Jazz Orchestra. They just don't play very much and there's not really an outlet or a club for them to play. Right. But No, I played a lot of big band and I studied it really hard and I really enjoy it. Got to read for that. You definitely got to read. We just had Danny Gottlieb here uh -huh. a couple weeks ago and he just wrote a book um, all about the drumming style of Harold Jones with Harold Jones from, nice. from the Basie Orchestra. So, um, so yeah, Carmine came through with his band King Cobra and I was four feet away from his bass drum and they was hitting big me in the chest drum. and I was just like looking up going i want to do that yeah, you know yeah and how old are you at that point i was uh <clears throat> like 16 or 17 years old you but know? i mean did you guys ever fall out of it you know i'm trying to find the hope for my kid mm. right i fell out of it because nope. i i i started playing when i was really young in 1976 and 1977 i was six and seven years old but i still wanted to play with my star wars figures and ride my skateboards and climb yeah. trees and ride my on banana, your phone yeah by my banana bike Didn't have fun you know then. yeah i know and then um and then when mtv popped and synchronicity came out in 1983 and martha quinn was the vj she was so cute i fell in love with her i was like that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> yeah, it's always so, about girls. So yeah. yeah. So what is it? We're at 1983 till now. So you were 13. Laser focus. <clears throat> yes. So, Laser. but it's got to happen. That that one little nuance Spark. of right moment. You know. And, it, and, it, and he said he sat down at the drums the other day and started playing around. I'm like, okay, you know, as a parent, you don't want to be like, oh yeah, you don't want to show. I, I see you. That's what you've discovered on your mm -hmm, own. Yeah. Mm -hmm, but I mean, mm -hmm. you do your you, you kids? Yeah. No kids. No kids. <clears throat> See, us guys, us road warriors, uh, we can't do it. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. You know, because I, my, my whole thing on that was I like to do, I'm a little bit of perfectionist in the sense that anything I want to do, I want to do a great job. Yeah. So if I'm trying to do a great job over here, how am I supposed to be doing a great job over here as a parent? It's like really tough. Well, you yeah. got to work. I mean, you know, it's. When do you sleep? Well, that's the thing is that. But he's, been, he's been gone for two months. I'm a working, well, I mean, but I'm you know, sustaining the family. Yeah. It's tough for me to be a dad. But a you come dad. home every night for dinner. I That's do. A good, this is, see, this is a good podcast. This stuff, this is the good stuff right here. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you Hard still got to gotta work, you know, Courtney. Oh. The thing about us is that the the notion of a single income stay-at-home mom is just about erased. You know, you, that doesn't exist anymore except with what Courtney yeah, and the, I did. The daycare thing going on. We right? couldn't. I mean, but the thing, but at that point, okay, you get a job to pay for daycare. What's the point? Because all that, all those funds go to pay for the daycare. Good point. You yeah. know, so Courtney stayed home with the kids. We, you know, worked on a radio man salary for, you know, the last uh, 10 years or so. And you know, after a while, you just, uh, I became self employed in 2016 and financially it's been better. But yeah, it's still being a parent still hard even when you're working. Totally. You know? Everybody check out Jim McCarthy voiceovers dot com and of and course his, his other company is the sponsor <laughs> of our show, Big Dot Lighting. Jim. Big yeah. Dot Lighting. Big Dot Lighting dot com. If you notice a lot of the lights in this, it's in this very studio bright. are uh, it's all LED. They're all LEDs. Oh, yeah. nice. Wave of the future. <laughs> Man. <laughs> hey, David, did you ever see this movie? Check it out. What do we got? Play an instrument? Yeah. I can't oh. I've never told you. I play bass. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. I slapped the bass big time. What, do you, what is that? You sound like a leprechaun. Oh, no, what that's that? a reggae guy. <laughs> I just did reggae. It doesn't sound... It doesn't sound reggae? No. Slap the bass. Oh, no. God. How is it? It's like big Slap. time. Big time. Big time. Big time. Slip the bass. Big oh, time. man, I had a guy tell me not to slap the, slap bass, the bass on a gig. Remind me to tell you that story. Oh, well, th this is, you know, Paul Rudd and Rashida Jones oh. in I Love You, Man. And I just, I slap the bass. Yeah, man, the bass. That movie is a Rush fan's big movie. Oh, Rush is that. highly, is, Rush is one of the main characters in the story. Yeah. I just love Paul Rudd's movies. Not Paul. I like enjoy Paul Rudd, but uh, Judd Apatow's films. His mm -hmm. movie, This Is 40. When I was about 40 when I saw it, and I was in my early 40s, and it's like everything about midlife crises and uh, hemorrhoids and hemorrhoids. Like all the We're stuff. We're talking hemorrhoids on I, this thing? I've never had, I'm Jesus. 44, I've never had a You hemorrhoid. gotta see I Love You, Man. <clears throat> you've, got, you've gotten them because of your rectal evan roots. Well, Sitting yeah. on this drum throne. All yeah, the, yeah. yeah, all the drum thrones now, all the low end, we have these 
that low end will get you in there, that man. Thumpers, we, that thumpers, that thumps yeah. my cheeks. Yeah, thumps. Oh, up and down, up <laughs> and down, up and loosens it up. Oh, my God. You're in trouble. So tell us about the slap in the back. Oh, so. well, you know, to finish that Sanborn thing, as I uh, he came forward from behind oh, yeah. the chair. Santos. Yeah, and he said, you moved here? I said, yeah. I said, man. Eight years ago. Yeah. Or maybe even longer now that you mentioned that date. But yeah, he said, uh, wow, but that's, let, let me get your number. He never called then either. <laughs> but David, if you're listening. <laughs> but some of the cats, sense? the guys in the band, were. he said, man, this guy, can I tell you guys, hold on a minute, stop playing everybody, hold on. Let me tell you that, and he held court for a minute and said about this young guy that flew in like that. He, he honored that story. It was pretty cool. He yes. said, you know, this guy had also to come and flew in at an audition callbacks, and they were like, whoa, that's how you do it, man. Yeah. And and I had my bass on my back, actually. Marcus came over and he said, what you got in the bag? You know, so we started talking. And I've known Marcus now for a long time, you know. So these, these uh, every little thing you do comes back. There's, there's uh, if you go, you got to go for things, you young drummers and bass players and musicians or whatever, you, you go for it with the uh, realization that it's not necessarily going to bear fruit right away. You might not get the gig. Well, I think, I think this generation's more entitled they 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 feel like it should come to them. Really? It might not happen yeah. until ten years later. You oh plant God. that seed, and I and you can't burn a bridge. I don't think you've ever burned a bridge. I've no for a fact. I've never intentionally tried to burn a bridge. You know, if, unintentionally. You know, if you can't literally do the gig, you sound you send someone better, and you try to do it in with at least two weeks notice. Yeah, be you professional. Know. <clears throat> yeah, things come back. I did a session with Mick Fleetwood years ago. I was in, in L.A. And uh, he then hired me to come to his other house. He had a house out in Malibu, there. right? <laughs> it was two, two or three oh, homes. Oh, no. In, um, uh, forgotten now, but it was a drive. It was a, it was a drive. Not in Malibu. What's uh, the Hawaii? Uh, Maui. Yeah. He has a restaurant yeah, in Maui, right? That I knew, yeah, yeah. that yeah. But this was in L.A. at the time. I went over there. And he recorded me. And it was great, and he loved my sound. And then years went by. I'm talking 10 years. And I was in a session in Nashville. Yeah. And I had my phone sitting there. Should have been off. I'm sorry, producers that were there. <laughs> it should have been off. It was on airplane mode. <laughs> it was sitting there, and it lit up. And we were about to go into, I'm, I'm not going to mention the drummer's name, because I don't want anyone to remember this session because I was acting professionally, uh, unprofessionally. I jumped up and went, ran outside, you know, of course. They were like, well, I was on two already. One, One. two. <laughs> Where's he hey, going? Mick Fleet's calling. <laughs> Mick Fleet, what's going? You're out the door. <laughs> yeah, next day I was in Norway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because John McVie wasn't feeling well. Right. And, you know, then we're talking a long time, a lot of water under the bridge, just a session. So these are, these are things that come back, you know. He said, man, can you? It was the manager, actually. And, uh, and he said, uh, David, uh, would you be interested in playing with Fleetwood Mac? And I said, yes. If, any questions that you have for me from this point forward, the answer is yes. Right. Uh, but I've got to get back inside. Yeah. And, and he said, okay, the answer is yes for everything. I said, for everything. Can you be in Norway tomorrow? Yes. And I said, I've got to go. And then I went back in, played the session. Called him back afterwards. Called him back, didn't get him on the phone, which was a drag, because I was like, oh, my God, waited, waited, how waited. I, how am I getting to Norway? He, right. All that. Uh, maybe he got Nathan East. Maybe he, it's over, you know? And I drove all the way to Spring Hill, mm -hmm. and uh, no phone yet after the session, nothing. Got home, like, he said, tomorrow. Fleetwood Mac, tomorrow? How am he I was thinking play? Norway, Tennessee. Yeah, Norway, Tennessee <laughs> is where I was going. I drove there, no. I got home, I just started downloading every... Fleetwood Mac song that was ever written, every album, and that's quite a repertoire. Let me tell yes. you, fifty years worth of great albums, and I'm they're just flying through. You know, I'm just going iTunes download, 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 and they're just coming through, roaring into my iTunes thing, and I'm like, God, this is going to be difficult. And he did say tomorrow, no phone call. I was like waiting, waiting. That was about maybe nine o'clock. It'd been quite a few hours. I said, it's not going to happen. So I went for a, a run in the neighborhood, went out walking around. The phone lit up, and it was uh, a block number, you know, so I knew it was, and it was Mick. David, it's Mick Fleetwood. I said, hey, said, John wasn't feeling well. He had some cancer th stuff going on. It's, it's, I can talk about it. It's, it's been in the news. Yes. Mm -hmm. Been a long time now. But anyway, he said, uh, can you be in Norway tomorrow? I, Marty says you can be in Norway tomorrow. And I said, yeah. And he said, "Okay, so uh, don't do this if you if you 
don't say you can do this if you can't, he said. If you can't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, uh, okay. And he said, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you something. And please don't, don't say yes if you, if you can't do it. I said, okay, ask me. <laughs> what are you going to say? The answer is yes, of course, right? Yeah. He said, can you clone John McVie in 24 hours and play a show? And I said, yes. Okay, I'm done here. And he hung up. And then I raced back to the house. The music was still coming in. And I thought, I, I did say yes, didn't I? Hmm. I've got to learn a lot of songs. Hey, did, what, did he give uh, you a set list to help you out a little yeah, bit? Yeah, then, then there were emails just, just roaring, you know, coming through yeah. management. Then, then when I got there, they flew me and I did it. And I listened the whole way. I didn't sleep. When I got there, there was uh, a guy heard me, saw me coming down the hallway. And I had my bags and everything. I'm like getting ready to go play with Fleetwood Mac. This is kind of cr- crazy. I mean, that's a good band. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about Fleetwood Mac for a well, second. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And they, yeah. I mean, they finish each other's sentences, I'm sure. And there's been ups and downs, but they keep coming back to that home base to right. make that music. And it's steeped in their relationships, which doesn't happen every day anymore. That's this heavy. Is, this is cathartic. They just were pretty big. Listening to what you just said. <laughs> That is, I gave me chills. What mm-hmm. you just said, I was looking right in your eyes when you said it. That is exactly the truth. That's heavy, man. That's so heavy. And I went, I got there, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to be playing with Fleetwood Mac. Okay, okay. So I'm walking down the hall, and this guy says, are you David Santos? And I turn around. And hey, Santos. <laughs> <laughs> you damn right I am. It's right. He says. Who's asking? Come here a minute. Come here. Come here. And I go, okay. All I wanted to do was get to my room. You know, that's a long flight. There's a lot of travel, yeah. a lot of international, a lot of, I'm not, I'm not great in airports. Yeah. You know, a lot of stress. <laughs> I thought it was Norway, Tennessee. It's, yeah. <laughs> I ended up in Norway, Tennessee. Yeah. And who are you asking my name? Yeah. <laughs> and it was, it, it was. It Did you was, have to shed on the flight? You were shedding on the flight? I couldn't. Oh. I couldn't. I just listened. and wrote, you know, wrote charts. charts. I, would, I, would, I mean, you're in coach, I would imagine. I was, kind of, I was no, I wasn't in coach. No, they, they for, first class. No, that's, well, yeah. Well, still, still oh, with yeah. first class with a base. You know, yeah, they, in first class you can do that. Yeah, no. <laughs> that'd be kind of funny. He says, "Come here." Come yeah, they wanted you to be comfortable. Yeah, yeah. totally. They, that's how they roll with first class. First class, you got to go on a uh, flight like that. Yeah, oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. They, those guys are. That's that's. There is no bigger band than that. That's yeah. that's the highest. If there's a pyramid, that's right at the very top, right? Right. Yeah. At the very top, like you know. Teetering on one leg. It's like in the dollar bill, the Illuminati the yeah. thing, the eye. The story reminds me of uh, uh, what's his name's uh, story. I can't think of his name now, but uh, the bass player for Metallica when he uh, they they booted Jason Newstead or he uh, left. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I know that guy. I know, guy, I know the bass player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. forgot his name. Yeah, Latin guy, Mexican. Yeah, guy. yeah, Great. Mexican. So they call you over. Mm. Mm. He was. Uh, he 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 goes. I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm the assistant to uh, Mick Fleetwood. That's his room there. You know, it's like a suite. Then he had his little room there. It was a suite too, but you know, it was the suite. And it was, mm-hmm. it was Mick Fleetwood. <laughs> and he goes, Mick's over there. So like, but let me tell you, I really want to talk to you about what's going on here. And I said, okay, okay. <laughs> so we go into his room. Why are we whispering? Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely on the down low. And he goes, look, uh, there's a lot of stuff I can help you with. We've got nine trucks and nine buses and we've got this and we've got that and a hundred employees and we, we're rooting for you, man. We, we really want you to do a great job and keep us out on the road, man. Oh my God, the pressure of the entire organization <laughs> is on your shoulders. Yes. It's all on you. No pressure. And That's I haven't it. even played a note And yet. that confidence you mentioned earlier came out and said, not a problem, all right? That's uh, heavy. Yeah, yeah, it was not a problem. He goes, and I, you I, know who I am. I, I, he goes, what, what, how can I help you? I said, let me get to my room. No, seriously, he said, uh, I want to be able to help you with anything at all. It, like, but let me just t- give you a couple of pointers. Mm-hmm. This is good stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, tell me. I drop my bags. And he's like, okay, Lindsay, <laughs> he's tough. I'm like, okay. He's like, he'll, he'll take your bass out of your hand and play for you what you're supposed to play and then want you to play it. And I'm like, okay. He's like, very tough. I've, I've heard this about him, 
but I've worked with Stephen Stills, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I work with John Fogart. No, no, Stephen Stills was very. Yeah, all your other gigs prepared you for this. Yeah, Stills was Stills was very, very. His old hat. Good. Well, Stills, Stills played bass on those records. Oh. So he was like, he knew every note on the, every, you know, Sweet Judy Blue Eyes was him, you know. It seems like almost every gig you've had, you have been in, under the microscope. It's been like that. Michelle and Dave Cello said to me, uh, you know, this guy, this is a great story. See, I can re relive these for people. This is interesting. I hope I can pass this inf information. I, I was in a in my uh, room at in my hotel, I mean, um, apartment in, a, in New York City. Phone rings and it's this guy. He says, hey, man, can you sub for me on this Michelle and Dave Cello gig? Yeah. I said, who's that? He said, oh, she's a new, she has a new record out. She's a bass player. Well, it's her record. He goes, yeah, but she wants to rap and she wants to play guitar and, and clavinet and she wants she needs a bass player. They're going to nail the gig. And I was like, well, yeah, sure. What do I do? I go down to this rehearsal place. I go down there. I walk in. Michelle and Deggie Cello is, no one knows who she is, right? No, right. The first record was Plantation Lullabies and it hadn't come out yet. I had it. I loved it. And she's sitting there messing around at the roads and uh, I walk in, didn't want to bother her. I guess that's the artist. I plug in my five string bass at the time, plugged it in, play. It was just qu quietly playing a few little, getting a tone, you know, New York City style, quick, boom, 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 just get it together. And then, and then she looks up, what are you doing? She gets up and walks up, what are you doing here? I said, <laughs> she didn't know. <laughs> I said, I, I'm subbing for Jerry. <clears throat> she said, what? This was her first gig in New York City, record release party. Wow. This was a big deal. Big Plantation deal. lullabies. Everyone's going to be there. There was like some, you know, uh, African American poets, and it was like a big, very big, very big deal. Packed, going to be packed, and and she says he's not coming to my gig. What? And and she storms out. Michelle, if you're hearing this, now you know what happened. <laughs> These are so many stories. They're all so intermingling. Great. This is incredible. She runs out. She comes back in 15 minutes later. Horn players are starting to drift in. You know, starting to get a little bit. Dicey, no charts anywhere. Yeah. I'm starting to think, is this getting weird? Okay, because where is she? She's mad. So she comes in and she goes, okay, all right. Obviously talked to Jerry. I made up that name. So <laughs> <laughs> Jerry the bass player. <clears throat> From Norway, Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. That sounded like yeah, she right. says, let's get started. <laughs> Do you know my music? I said, I've never heard your music. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Now, we're talking about, we're, this is about two o'clock. Did you do it? And did you after that go? And you are you. It kind of was like that, right? Honest to God. So she was kind of already a little bit so, of a diva at all. Or? No, she was just desperate. This was right. a very serious situation. This right. was like her music is bass centric. Very. This music is the bass line is the song, and then there's some words that are prof prophetic, you know, incredible poet stuff right, right, right. on top of this bass so, line. So this is two p.m. and the record the release party at is seven. at seven, and you've never heard her music. Don't know her. I did know the drummer, Gene Lake. We went to Berkeley together. Oh, Gene Lake, is this a little bit of chartage going on? So just... I had my music paper with me. Right. And I said, okay. She goes, let's get started. And the horn players are like, man, you know, they don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. It's like they just wanted to do their rehearsal, quick little thing, go over a few things and get over to the, you know, get something to eat and then For go sure. to the gig. And I, and I got to learn, you know, 15 songs, yeah. whatever it was. And so she says, uh, okay, let's get started. She said, I had a five string. And she, she goes, let me see your bass. <laughs> I take it off and I hand it to her and she takes my five string. She doesn't like five string bass right off the bat. She, oh, she's a, is she a four? She's a four stringer, right. yeah. And so she goes, all right. And she hands it back. Play me that. That's the bass line on the verse. You know, whatever the fuck it was. I'm my <laughs> so so she, she, she knew that you had the ability Ability probably to save the day for her, but she was still posturing. Oh, it was a total uh, power was, move, like right there. Yeah, and then you played totally. it back for her. Did you yeah. play it back. I played it as close as I could. You know, it's not going to be like that. Who can do that? I don't know if yeah. you know Larry Graham couldn't do that. Right. But I, I played, you know, an approximation of it, and I said, "Listen," and she, she'd get frustrated, and she'd say. This is a bass player's band, man. Well, she should play the bass. I know, and I said, "Listen, I, I just this is for you guys." I said, now you got to look at me. If you give me a minute, it will be a bass player's band. Yeah. 
Should I translate that into the microphone? Yeah. If you give me a minute, it will be a bass player's band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she respected that? She said, all right, good. Confidence. So I started playing, <clears throat> and then I wrote things quickly. Berkeley came in handy. It came, you know, very handy. Yes. Uh, bass line, boom, bit, 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 don't rip down. Okay. And she looked at it. Mm. And I said some things like, "Is that so? That's an ostinato there." It's just, mm. and then and the guy goes, "What is that?" She says, "What does that mean?" And, mm. I, and they get, Gene, a "You're a bass player, aren't you?" <laughs> yeah. A repeated rhythmic phrase. That's yeah, yeah. The bass, the drummer said that. Yeah. Gene, he got all white with it. A repeated rhythmic phrase. <laughs> so, <laughs> not only did your Berkeley background kick in, but the confidence from that first gig in New York of just just saying. Huh, I'm here. Yeah, man. That's when you right. sh- we show up in New York City, it's cold. Your apartment is that doesn't work. He doesn't work. You know, you got to hurry up and make a, like you're, you you got to make yeah. fifteen hundred bucks before the first. You showed up like, uh, yeah. do you know who I'm gonna be? Yeah, I'm gonna be right at whatever you want me to be. <laughs> yeah, right now. <laughs> that, you know, and that's so exciting. And like, I don't want to say anything negative about Too good. The, Sorry about that. I, ever about Nashville because she's been so good to all of us, but. You're going from, funny story. You're going from Manhattan to being based out of Nashville. That was in, crazy. In the year 2000. That was crazy. That was a lot of, uh, what is the word for that? Culture shock. It's a culture shock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, big time. And and Matt Rawlings was on the first session I did at Berkeley. Mm-hmm. So when I walk in there, there he is. And again, young is the key word, but great is the key, most key word. He's, mm-hmm. He was genius level. At that age, he was already playing McCoy Tyner y kind of stuff. So, but when then he was a, a top session player here in the year 2000. So, you reached out to him when you moved here. Yeah. So, we've not worked together, unfortunately, that much. Oh. Because he's just been busy and I, yeah. got, I went on the road. I'm a live guy. Right. I really am. I, I've realized that now. But you, st- but you know what? You still find yourself in all these sessions Billy Joel, Cindy Buck, Kirk Whalen, Bob Seeger, yeah, Keith Urban. A few not, sessions. And you know what's really funny? I personally, I mm. feel like if people. Mm-hmm. We're never going to get around to all these stories. You you got to write your your memoir, man. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, a lot of it is is interesting Call it because fired. the posturing no, that was done against you, you kind of have license to do now. You know, not that oh. you would come in and be a diva, but I mean, you know, you can come in and, and posture yourself and be like, <laughs> dude. Do you know who I've played with? <laughs> do you know? Let me tell you something. But he you know who I am. We try not to do that, but I, I have know. had to break that out. Right, I've had to. Because sometimes people can get a little jerks, right? Yeah, it happens, yeah. and I'm, sometimes you just have to go. What do you call it? Vibing people, right? Yeah. Vibing someone out. Someone can vibe you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the other day, I said something to somebody, and I probably shouldn't have, but you know, like, like. But isn't that kind of you think you are? Isn't you know? that part of you know part of the you know uh, <laughs> school of of hard knocks type of upcoming? Yes. You know they do it. In, I, oh I, yes. Yeah, they do it in the electrician field. It happened to me in radio. I had a podcast the other day with a, a pal of mine who, when I went to move to Vegas, I lived out there for four years, and uh, when I went out there, I had a radio career in Connecticut um, where I cut my teeth and really started, you know piling on the experience and I became a very big fish in a very small pond. Yeah. What station? What what uh, what were the call? Oh, it was the home of rock and roll. Mm. The one and only. The one and only? Right. That's right. We played classic rock and today's rock. Beautiful. I've heard I-95 you. rock. I've heard this voice. So Not bad. I-95 WRKI in Brookfield, Danbury. 95.1. The home of rock and roll. Yeah. We played Fleetwood Mac I, the, many times. 95. Yes, yes. The idea is that no matter what season of life we're in, I feel like we're always proving ourselves. Amen. We're but, never done paying our dues. Amen. When I came out to Vegas, I was working with people I read about in trade magazines. Sure. So mm. I read about the program director for Extreme Radio. I read about Cat Thomas, who was a legendary program director you for studied. WC. Oh, I just knew these people. And it's like, for some reason, when I would read about this cluster of stations, mm. I felt like... There was a connection there, and I ended up working for him. So the one guy I interviewed Mm. actually had a parody song that went, I guess, for that day and age, viral. So it was international. Uh, Back in the day, Eminem and Christina Aguilera were like this. They were they were going to go head to head. Eminem would take pot shots in his songs about her. And for whatever reason, she never retaliated. It was always in the tabloids that she would just say, well, whatever. So my buddy Spence decides to do a parody song sure. from her angle. So he got somebody in Vegas to sing it. <clears> that sounded enough, enough alike uh, Christina Aguilera. Disguised it on the air as a, as a package that came from her production company and they played it on the air. Yeah. Like 
exclusive for that particular radio station out of Vegas for KLUC. It went nice. He says it was played in Japan and, and all the worldwide. And it was just, and I read about that. So here I was, I actually moved out to the, to the station where he was and he kind of proceed his, his, his reputation preceded me. And the whole point of me telling the story is the fact that I got surrounded by people that raised my talent level. Sure. And that's, yeah, that's, that's a big what, part of it. That's what we you know? do. Yeah, yeah. But talk, talk about being postured. That's right. The peer, oh yeah. You, you, well, everybody around you brings you up to their level. If yeah. you, if you're open to that. Yeah. Spence, if you're not open to that, you're not. As, Spence, as much of be a, listening to this, Spencer. Yeah. As much of a good friend he became, he would always remind me of how, you know, small I was. He's like, oh, what are you from Delaware or something? Like that? How, how did he know that? What's that? That how, you were that how small. small? Just kidding. I know. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, let me, that was that was perfect. Are we going to edit timing. this? Hey. No. We, we hardly edit anything. No. Warts and all. I'm assuming that the Michelle Indicello gig yes. went incredibly well. The the Fleetwood Mac Great gig. Story. Tell which one, Michelle or the, the Fleetwood? That, like I'll let people. I nailed I nailed the Fleetwood Mac gig. I mean I nailed the Michelle and Dave gig. The Fleetwood Mac. Gig I assume did, that did, didn't there, happen. But there's a there's an end to the story of Fleetwood Mac. There's an end. It's an odd end, and it's a very uh, it's it's. A, and I wouldn't say a disappointment because I I fulfilled my obligation and I was there right as I was told to be there and when I got there. Do you want to hear this? I, sure. I, I think there's some sort of a moral to the story because you, I know the story. Ah, uh, but the listeners I want to hear don't. That. I have not. This okay. is brand new to me. All right, I hear it. You, the, you crammed. You flew to Norway. Yeah, you're ready. Keep going. I like how you tell it. The band <laughs> comes in. <laughs> True. So the band far. comes in. You're all set yeah. to play. Yeah. And and okay, that's exactly right. What happens is there's management involved. There's insurance involved. There's money, ticket sales involved. There are venue payments involved. There are truck drivers and blah, 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 employees involved. There's all that involved. It's not just Michelle and Deggie Cello walk in and like nail this gig in New York City, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not that. No. It's a whole other, this There's is a- Nine trucks, nine you're on a different yeah. planet. We're yeah. talking yeah. about multi, like billions of dollars. We're not talking about like just, uh, you know, what am I, is it 250? I forgot to ask you. <laughs> 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 $25 per diem or is it 50 Isn't it 50 when we're in Tokyo? <laughs> Can you take the cream out of my Oreos, please? <laughs> what did I say about the brown <laughs> M&Ms? <laughs> I only like quilted no, blankets. There's a million, oh. <laughs> millions and millions of Eddie. dollars on the line right. and people's jobs. I work with Eddie Van Halen. That's a story. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I just heard a podcast with David Lee Roth on it. Mm. He is brilliant and funny He's and great, smart man. and hilarious. Oh, yeah. So they're all like that. Pretty much. I so, got there to the gig. We drove to, we, we was, uh, it was some New York guys. This guy, Rich Wyman, had met Eddie Van Halen and Valerie, and he had a, st a steady solo gig at this mountain resort with a fireplace. You know, and Eddie would come in and you know from skiing all day, and they'd get drunk and laugh and play, and became friends. Yeah. So he wanted to produce him. So it happened to be I was in his band. Yeah. In mm -hmm. New York City, <clears throat> great drummer Kevin Hupp. I don't know if you know Kevin. No, I don't know Kevin. He's a badass. You should yeah. know Kevin. He's yeah. good. I put him up there on the in the greats. It was in New York. Anyway, so we went out there, and we drive down this hill. We go, it's Coldwater Canyon. I don't want to tell where Eddie lives, but we go up this road, mm -hmm. and then we drive right into this world of Eddie's. And the 5150 a, Studios? That's right. Yeah. And, and there's this uh, gate, you know, it opens. He's off of yeah. Mulholland somewhere. I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is, it, then, is it a picture Steel's, of Steel's is it a Steel's picture house. of him and Dave, and when the gate opens, it's them separating? That's exactly. It's <laughs> very symbolic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> wow, dude. It's like they keep coming back together, and they keep separating, and uh, they keep coming final, back together. Final tour. <laughs> <laughs> Farewell tour. <laughs> Farewell to <laughs> That's funny, man. I'm gonna. That's right. Go. Doom. Yeah. I go I'm in gonna, there. I'm gonna do the crowd applause on that. That was a good. That was a good joke. This is a very Van Halen. Like, I'm just gonna give a good funny part of the story, not the the, all, uh, the darkness of the story or any weirdness. I don't want to do any <laughs> bad things. It's just the good stuff. Just good stories. The good story. Yeah. Uh, was that um, okay? A good part of the story was we drove there past the servants' quarters, and I thought it was his mansion. But anyway. <laughs> Seriously, you're you're overdoing that, McCarthy. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That was a good joke. Yeah. Yeah. So we go in <clears throat> 5150. 
We do a lot of playing. Alice was there. Yeah. And we play, 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 loud, loud, loud. A lot of rock and roll. It's really good, you know, of course, first day. And um, Eddie's playing. And then it ends. It's been a long day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say it was about, I'd say maybe it was nine at night. I'm, I'm, I'm toast, he said. I'm toast. That's what he said. He came walking up and gave everybody a hug and a kiss. Sweetheart. Yeah. And uh, we leave. We drive down the hill. We just play with Eddie Van Halen, man. And what year was this? This was around 90. Okay. So still in the Hag Hagar years. Hagar. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we get back to the host. <laughs> he was there. He There's came out. things going on in here. He's not sharing. <laughs> What's up, Edward? He was there, and he came. He came. Uh, I mean, Hagar came driving up in a red sports car convertible. It was pretty cool. It was Beautiful the. Girl. It was the one from uh, I Can Drive Fifty Five. I would imagine maybe the Ferrari. It looked like a Ferrari. Yeah, <laughs> they had a lot of Ferraris. Eddie's yeah. into cars. Yeah. A lot of cars. Yeah, man, there are cars out there lined up all along the. There's a big fountain, and anyways, a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> This is, I'm like oh, I'm unwrapped man. with the story this right is, now. All right, well here here here's let me, the, as I said this bad parts of the story because it was a week long, a lot of you know let me drink this beer in one sip kind of thing and squ squeeze the can yeah you know a little spittle on the side and wipe it and who won you know that kind of stuff but yeah. there was still good stuff too yeah but anyway so he says hey, guys I'm 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 fried you know bye and so we drive down the thing we play with Eddie he's great and then we go to this Mexican restaurant we're sitting around and drinking and laughing and talking and, wow that was great wasn't it yeah Eddie's great isn't he yeah well I'm tired yeah me too back to bed now we go to sleep tomorrow's gonna be a good day get up early run you know and we're gonna go play with Eddie Van Halen so we, we get up there and he's not there so we're like Okay, the guitar player John Golden's great guitar player. I play with Meatloaf. He lives in New York, but he he was he, anyway. He's the guitar player, and he says, "There's Eddie's guitar. Hey man, you think I could play it while Eddie's not around? Just like to play a couple notes on it." <laughs> this engineer's there. Yeah, yeah, sure he wouldn't mind. Yeah, go ahead. So he flips on the switch to the amps. These big amps that he has. Right? Oh man, the go. EVH amps were they? Uh, yeah, EVH amps. Yeah. But I, I I don't think that. Never mind. I'm not supposed to say that. Okay. I'm not, it, it wasn't the PV stuff. Yeah. Right. There was a lot of amps. There were right. a lot of amps. So he, he flips it on and he's got the bass. The guitar's already on, you know, and it goes Whoa, loud and it's like, <laughs> it's too loud. It blew your hair back. Yeah, everybody. You're reaching for stuff, you know. Like, what the hell? Is <laughs> back to the future moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, I don't think we were playing that loud, Definitely. were we? Last night? Were we? Playing that loud? Oh my god! Yeah, so, <laughs> so, no, but the engineer goes. I'm laughing. This is a funny story. The engineer goes. Oh, Jesus! Oh, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Take that off. Put it down. And so he goes on the phone. Yep. Hey, Eddie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're here. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. a master storyteller. <laughs> I know. <laughs> He's painting yeah, the picture. Yeah, that Santos is here. Yeah, that guy's here. Yeah, anyway, no, seriously. They're here. Yeah, okay, but He goes, oh, listen, man, guys. Remember when he said he was fried last night and everything? And we're like, yeah. He goes, he stayed up all night playing. <laughs> he came in. <laughs> we were the warm-up act. He and, rocked all night, like, you know, yeah. the stun volume. <laughs> Did this project ever come out? Yeah, it's on his website. I'm surprised. Yeah. If you go to eddievanhalen.com or vanhalen.com, yeah. you can do it right now. I mean, tomorrow, any listener, you'll you'll see it. It's right there, man. It's like he liked it. We we would love to have them Took on the show. Took a badass solo, huh? We would love to have them on the show, the brothers. That'd be epic. Yeah. They're, they're, but uh, I think Alex is he's a, he's he's a, a bit of a recluse. Yeah. I, didn't, I only dude. met him once. Great, drummer. and I can't tell this part of the sto so story. Inspirational. So inspirational, yeah. Okay, so should we do two things? Should we finish the Fleetwood Mac story, mm. or should we talk about your eleven it rules of the road? Eleven rules of the road. I looked us up on the net. What are they? Do you know what one of them is? That was Jim, a long you, time ago. Can you guess? I, I was this is guessing. great advice. Bring Thanks toilet paper when you go for a walk. Don't no pooping on the bus. Yeah, well, that's true. No tuna fish. Look, we on went the bus. right for the. Right. Wait, why no tuna fish on the bus? I've been the doing stinks. that lately. 
It smells. Oh. You can't bring. Tuna I get fish. it. I oh, get Jesus. it. Jesus. Check this out for you guys out there that want to <laughs> do what David Santos has done. DavidSantos.com. <laughs> bring a power adapter mm. for foreign countries. Yeah. Always have a laundry bag. Yeah. Number two. Yeah. Write down the name and the address Ooh. of the hotel before venturing out. That's right. Grab Write it on your key drinks if you can. from yes. the backstage area to take back to the hotel so you don't have to pay mini bar prices. And food, too. I like that. Always have a credit card. Yeah. Learn the rules of the cultural, the tipping culture in that country. Well, Sometimes you don't even have to oh, tip. Oh, interesting. Right? Yeah. Um, exchange your money at the airport for a better rate. Road stuff. Put a do not disturb sign on the door so the maids won't wake you up in the morning. Wait, sometimes you want them to. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in France. Um, do not... Russia. Do, uh, Russia. Do not rely um, on the hotel sorry. to wake you up during right. an alarm clock. That was back in the day. Don't read that. That dates me. No one uses uh, those no, wake-up calls anymore. Well, I use the uh, I, I do use the, the front uh, desk the... and the iPhone. Oh, you're right. careful. Yeah. I do the iPhone because sometimes they forget. You were actually so careful that time we you're went to right, Miami. Like we had a flight back and it was the last flight of the day. Right. And you actually said, you know, last I can't miss day. this flight. You know, I can't, I, got, I have to be back for the next day's yeah. rehearsal. Right. And I cannot chance this flight being canceled. And Courtney and I were like, I was like, I, I literally looked at you and said, dude, if you don't want to fly back with us, just tell us. And no, like, no, that's not what it is. I'm it's like, not that. And I, and I was just, I'm I love just, you guys. I, I cajole him all the time. I'm, I'm like, it's all right. I get it. And I you set know, my alarm. Had enough 848 a.m., 852 a.m. Eight, and that way, if, Preparation. if you do the sneeze yeah. function, yeah, you're you still you getting more alarm. Yes. Yeah. Good one. See, yeah. so so that's what Rules that's, of the road. Yeah, we're almost done here. Learn uh, how to cater your own dishes to make sure you, you know. Learn how to change a tire on a bus. Right. And yes, if you're going to play with Garth Brooks. No, but anyway. <laughs> and pick up, I, a, pick a forward bunk on the bus in case the insomniacs are partying in the back playing PlayStation. That's how I do it. But, yeah. you know, we don't, Melissa does, she, we, the way, can I keep talking or are we, oh, are we winding yeah. down? Yeah. Melissa stuff. Etheridge, let's go into a little Melissa chapter. How much time I got? A minute, two, no, three? Good, we fine. usually do an hour, but hey, for you, 90 minutes, easy. Okay, yeah. well, Melissa Etheridge, let's talk about Melissa Etheridge. We'll go three hours. What the heck? Okay, Melissa is, uh, uh, who likes her? Oh, I, I like love her, her music. Yeah. yeah. Love My her wife music. loves her. Yeah. Loves Who music. doesn't like her is a better yeah. question. She's amazing. Great songwriter. Very prolific. Mm -hmm. Wrote about maybe 250 great songs. So, you know, if you got the tour, you should know the tunes. Mm -hmm. You should know all the tunes. I remember right. having the, that first record on cassette around 1989. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the first record. Yep. Yep. Cassette. Cassette. Cassingle. It, it broke and you used a pencil. That's right. <laughs> She's great. She had that short, spiky hair. She was all sassy. Mm -hmm. Yep, she's great. She had, uh, uh, she talks about it, and she she had uh, a bout with cancer and mm -hmm. kicked it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. God bless her. Now she's a major spokesperson for uh, Susan G. Komen, I believe, right? Or one of those organizations. It's well, she wrote a song for it. Oh, well, I don't know the name used, of it. But okay. Yeah. Well, Susan G. Komen is that's our big charity. Without Tell me about we've it. raised m millions of dollars for breast really? cancer research. Yeah, that's that, why I run. She's in that. Okay, yeah, yeah. I run for life. I run for life. That's oh, right. Oh, okay, that's yeah. for that, Susan. Okay, mm -hmm. I didn't, I knew it was for a, a cancer uh, cause. Yeah, and she Jeez. kicked it. And she's so she smokes medical marijuana. Yeah, and uh, so that that's a lovely smell. I like the smell on the bus. Yeah, the Earth. Mm. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a medicine that goes back to the ancients. That's right, natives, Native Americans. Yeah, mm -hmm. I almost uh, died on it one time. It's great. Oh, because it's so strong. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. Well, I came home one night and Wendy was singing. This mm -hmm. is a great story as well with having in the back. Guys, <laughs> she sings at the kitchen table. We've got a world class recording studio mm -hmm. in the home. In the home downstairs, nice. it's a thousand square feet. It's got. Uh, you know, it's got a tracking room in it yeah. about this size. Sure. It's got drums, Ludwig drums, and mic'd up, and we have a, a vocal booth and an amp a ISO room and a, whatever it is and a hardwood floor. And we got the, that. That's good. That's really great. But she doesn't like to record in there. And she'll she'll do lots of recording. I mean, she recorded on, she's on Eric Clapton's last record. She's, yeah. uh, she's a great, great. But anyway, she'll, 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 she likes to record at the kitchen table. Hmm. This is the My Marijuana Story. Mm-hmm. My emergency room story. <laughs> <laughs> You're nuts, man. So is this is this dying, almost dying on medical marijuana with Wendy or out on the road? This is at home. Okay. This yeah. is at home. But this is musical. Yeah. 
she was recording uh, she was doing Trace Atkins record and at the kitchen table and standing there singing and I come walking in honey I'm sorry for telling this story but I'm gonna do it then we'll get back to Melissa. we can always take it out yeah I come in and uh, the kitchen is where she's at she's there recording headphones and she's singing and emoting and singing and working her own pro tools on the laptop and there's our refrigerator and I'm tired I've been at a session all day and I want to eat a little something, so I tiptoe in, and I quietly, and she turns around and, honey, I'm trying to record. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't eat. I'm hungry. So it's, it's late. You know, I go in the bedroom, and I'm, well, I'll go to bed. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And I'm looking, and there's a brownie. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that looks good. Everyone's got one of these brownie stories. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Do you have a uh, you, you ate the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Really? You washed it down with some almond milk. And almond then, milk. And then you started seeing aliens and <laughs> God and pyramids yeah. and the beginning of the earth. And you, you all of a sudden were trans, transported to Norway, Tennessee. <laughs> right. Again. That's wow. it. Yeah. Everything. Everything you mentioned. <laughs> all of it. It's incredible. How long did that buzz last? Oh, my God. I literally went to the emergency room. I'm not kidding. Really? I I didn't know that was marijuana in my system. Wow. Because you're supposed to just take one. Oh, so you started freaking out about how you felt. I woke up at about three in the morning, and the room was like, uh, (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Wow, man. (laughs) There was the TV right there, and now it's... Over it's there. a Maui Wowie. It man. was a Cheech and, uh, Cheech and Chong film <laughs> happening. I thought, and hey, mama mouth. talking to me, trying to tell me how to live. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did they say at the uh, emergency room? What did they say? They're like, I, oh, I, sir, I, this I, is I, just I, marijuana. I, 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 walk, I go, you know, my face, I, uh, my, my mouth. I so you had Bell Palsy. <laughs> I thought I was having a heart attack. I was that off, the first I, time for you? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, and for eating it, yeah, it's right. not good. Don't, I mean, eating it's different. It's, yeah. Real. Don't be doing it if you're not used to it. Let me put it that way. Eat it only on a time when you know you I did have the first 12 time. hours with nothing to do. I did it the first time at a gig. It, you ate it? No, I smoked it. Oh. oh. First yeah, time the, ever. But the eating is. Playing yeah. drums, yeah, the yeah, eating. Playing eating. drums. Going and into it, the second set. So you were dragging nice. your butt Do you remember off. the set? No. It was like do do got do do. Well, the guy who the guy who the guy who actually swinging. <laughs> Why are you swinging during cult of personality, yes. Jim? So the guy who actually oh, had Jesus. me introduced to it, he'd been trying to do it for years, and I I swore I'd never do it. You gotta so take a hit, this, Jim. This Come particular on. night, for whatever reason, I decided, what the heck, I'll just do it. So he smoked, and I said, so what? He says, look. Nothing may happen. Okay, it's your first time. May keyword. But if if it does, you're gonna think everything's funny at first. Oh sure. And Spencer, then are you listening? And Wait. then <laughs> you know, like he's gonna listen. Uh, he'll listen to this down after I'm dead or oh something. Oh my god. So. Oh my god. And the next thing you're gonna know is that everybody <laughs> knows. Yeah. So I'm sitting there playing drums. Oh. We got up on, the, you know, we finished doing our thing outside, came back in for the second set. I sit down, start playing. And he, he's a tall drink of water, this guy. He's another fellow friend, uh, a drummer, a friend of mine. And he's right, everybody's <laughs> dancing. He's just sitting right at the front of the stage looking at it. me. And I'm sitting there playing and I'm going, <sighs> laughing. And he's laughing too. And I'm just going, stop. He stopped. Stop. And all of a sudden, and the guitar player's like looking at him. What's wrong Look with these me. guys? <laughs> Look at him. What the heck's going on? Then all of a sudden, he mouths the words, everybody knows. Oh, yeah. And I start going. Then you become paranoid. The yeah. paranoid <laughs> happens. Oh, he laughed. He laughed. I laughed. It's good. He laughed. Yeah. Yeah. You don't yeah. want to get into the paranoid thing. Hilarious. That was a good story. It's crazy. So uh, you're, you're okay. You're alive. I, yeah, you're I'm here. here. <clears throat> oh, here. we're going to the doctor. So, but what you is, just didn't know what was going on. Yeah, right? I didn't know what was going on in uh, you know, the mouth. And so I said, I walk out and she's still singing. <laughs> I go, honey, stop singing. Stop singing. She, she stops. She just, we got to go to the emergency. <laughs> I don't mean to I'm laugh. Thinking, I'm thinking, a heart attack. Like, Did you eat that brownie? <laughs> no, nobody knew. I forgot the brownie. I forgot about it. Who knew? I just, it was a brownie, you know? Yeah. That's hilarious. I said, she goes, well, okay, okay. So she stops and all right, well, uh, which okay, emergency room? You know, we don't, we haven't been to the emergency room. Yeah, Spring mm-hmm. Hill. Yeah. Okay. Good. 
All right, she's looking. Well, which one you? And I'm like, let's just go now. And she's like, somewhere. I think I'm having a heart attack mm-hmm. or a stroke. Can't move. I can't feel my face. And I really want some Doritos. <laughs> yeah, the munchies. I want some Funyuns. The munchies. She said, oh, this one here? I said, whichever's the closest. She, she goes, okay. So we get in the car. We race there. Get there. Walk in. I'm high as hell. <laughs> it's so high. And, and I, she's black. My wife. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it's cold. Uh-huh. I've got a rock star jacket on with a thing around my sc- scarf, and uh, and I'm just the first thing I grabbed, and it's cold. And I walk in, and I'm in the emergency room, the neon <laughs> lighting, with a black chick at three o'clock in the morning in Spring Hill, Tennessee. <laughs> what did they, they, what they, they say? Think <laughs> this story is hilarious. They, they think I, it's, she's my hooker, <laughs> and I'm her pimp. Oh no. And I'm gonna I, maybe I just like you know did heroin or something I yeah. don't know, so I walk in and we I sit down and he goes well what can I how can I help you I go well, uh, well um, I could see I could see you're a doctor, but I can't tell you're a doctor does that make sense He was like I can see you're a doctor, <laughs> but so I he starts can't writing this down tell you're a doctor he's writing it down. Anyway, I'm in there for two or three hours. Yeah, paranoid as hell. I think that they they took Wendy away because she came, she left to do paperwork and stuff. And I'm mm-hmm. like, they took her away, and she had to finish the song. <laughs> oh man, right? Yeah, right. Anyway, long story short, they, it, it was uh, diagnosed that I had overdosed on marijuana. <laughs> Overdose. Yes. <laughs> Holy cow. So I didn't even know that was possible. You're so not supposed to eat the whole thing. They don't, they don't pump your stomach or anything. No, you they can't. Just, she just, said, just, go home and just, I'm sorry. Just sleep it off. Yeah. It's going to be rough for the next eight Twice to daily, 12 hours. right over there. Go get yourself a snack. Eight to 12 hours for sure. So, anyway. The, so to segue, looking back. Ah. Uh. Come on. On your career. Come on. That is hilarious. Come on, Richie. <laughs> that is hilarious. I've j- <laughs> that is one of the funniest Wait, guys, stories I've ever had. G- <laughs> we all have giggles. Like, right? we ate the brownie. Se- come on, segue. Marijuana Fleetwood stories Mac. are hilarious. Here's how Fleetwood Mac ends. <laughs> yes, they are. This one wasn't. But anyway, uh, uh, so I go on stage to play, and then I go to start to play the um, the music they are all how can we help you how can how can we help you and i'm like i'll just let me just get a minute with the music mm-hmm. and i'm in the house you're right? i'm like in this the enorma dome and boom do 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 i'm learning this you know playing the part <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the classic bass lines yeah. classic rock totally mm-hmm. the radio perspective mm-hmm. those songs are played every day and everyone knows that they have rotation that. And I'm like, okay, okay, I got to have that like nailed. And by the way, can we just say, that's one badass bass player. Awesome. That dude. I've recorded that song two or three, uh, with two or three groups as a cover. People love that song. Yeah. The Chain. The Chain. Yes. Mm. So they're all, and one of the guys was my tech with Fogarty. So I had, I had an inf- a friend. Nice. That's nice. Uh, he was great. And, um, Everybody's trying to help me, and you know the guy comes over because I'm I'm uh, John's tech. And what, what's going to happen is uh, between tunes, you throw your arm like this, and I slide over the you know the bass changes. You know he uses his basses. You know, let's practice. I go okay. So lean this way, arm up. Okay, take it, dip, and then you're off. Plug in next tune. I'm like yep. Yeah. <laughs> so- <laughs> it was like gymnastics. <laughs> arm up, yeah. side bend, next yeah. bass, plug in. <laughs> It's like that cartoon. But yeah, they're talking to you about changes. You guys haven't played a single not note a together. Not a note yet. <clears throat> not a note. Not a note. So a, the band, so you're That's doing bizarre. stuff, but the whole band is out in the house. They haven't gotten there yet. Okay. They haven't gotten there yet. That I knew of. Yeah. Are you are you looking for the candid camera kind of thing? Whether those moments? Like, hey, where, where's, where's Alan from? I was so, just so like, uh, right. you know, overwhelmed. And tired. And, and, right. Tired. And want to want to nail the Fleetwood Mac gig. And now, mind you, I nailed the Toto gig. Yeah. But can I brag? <clears throat> to brag? Yes, brag, for God's sake. How you dropped t- something. Ex- when am I? <laughs> XP braggadocious. <laughs> how many people can do the Toto gig with no rehearsal? Oh, you got to come in. You got to know it. Come on. Yeah. And you did it with Simon Phillips? Or Greg Bishop. Shannon Forrest. Oh, it's Shannon. Okay, Fantastic. Nice. Yeah, yeah. 
Fantastic. They've had a whole bunch of guys in that band. A lot of drummers, yeah. <clears throat> who's who, who's been in the band? Um, Jeff Percaro. Jeff Percaro first. Jeff? And then oh, Simon Percaro. Phillips, right? Greg Bissonette filled in, and then Simon Phillips did the gig forever. And, Simon. And then uh, yeah. now Shannon. And Shannon's doing a great job. Sure, well, that as, was, as that was his hero. He loved Jeff Percaro. Yeah. I mean, who Simon, doesn't love Jeff He Percaro? sounds like himself, though, Shannon does. That's good. Mm -hmm. He sounds like himself. We're, we're snowflakes. We're all so unique. You can't take the uniqueness out of us. We we're wow. talking, yeah. But you know, the thing about Simon Phillips always been is I look at his drum kit. I'm like, mm. dude, make up your mind, all right? Make some small drums <laughs> for drums. crying out loud. And he, you know uses, what I mean? he uses them all. He does. Great. Oh, he's great. And he's a lefty. But he's ambidextrous. Is he? Yeah. Okay. That was a great thing. The Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac was great. and I ended up not playing with them. Because <laughs> they, f they didn't feel right about it because they were missing a family member. Yes. That's exactly what happened. Right. I, I uh, what an experience, though. Yeah, Incredible. I'm on stage and I'm there, and I see it's just no one in the venue except for an usher way back there. Way. Back <laughs> 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 what did you put in these clips? <laughs> Are you sure this is Lacroix? <laughs> There's one usher, and he's leaning against the wall, like you know, waiting because later he's going to be busy all night with like you know, hundred thousand people in this yeah. joint, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I'm playing these bass lines doo -doo 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 -doo, and whatever it is. And then it's re it's like, you know, all bouncing around this huge dome, that my bass, and it's still in the house. And I'm focusing and I'm writing quick little notes to myself because I'm going to play with Fleetwood Mac. And I said, and he said, don't say you can do this if you can't. And I'm like, I, I can't, right? And I'm gonna, so I look up and no one is there. Like no one. Like no one. Just that usher. Way about a mile away. All the way at the end. And I'm like, where's the crew? My one ally from Fogarty Band, he's gone too. I'm alone on this <laughs> giant stage. Yeah. Playing through three SVTs and... A massive PA system. In the house. Yeah. Boom. Oh! You know. Mm. Yeah. Boom. Oh! You know, I'm like, oh... So if everything I play, well, that's all right. I've got to just keep playing and just learn this one, that one, the other one quick. And then, well, hour goes by. Nobody there. I'm nosing the music and this and that. I see a guy waving me over out there by the usher. <laughs> you had a plate of brownies. <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, Is this like the ending to the brownie story? <laughs> it's better. It's worse. It's worse. I, 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 it's the manager. Yeah. But I mm -hmm. see towering over him is Mick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Six foot nine, Mick. You know. Oh my god! Yeah, that's right. He's big. So, so tall. So I go out there. I put the bass down and I run out to the, the there. They are and Marty steps forward. Marty's the manager. You know, yeah. Mick's back like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Line of defense. <coughs> yeah. A anyway, I go, yeah? He goes, we're shutting it down. I said, Sh you shutting what down? The gig, the tour, everything. I said, you're shutting the gig down. Oh, man. Aren't we going to play? Mick, Mick. <laughs> <laughs> I can. <laughs> yeah, I can I do can. this. <laughs> and they just said, look, we just. They couldn't do it. Yeah. I don't think it had anything to do with me. I really don't. I th yeah. Although I probably, it probably maybe had a little to do with me. Oh, I mean, obviously it had to do with me. What am I talking about? Well, you the did, show must go on, though, for crying That's what I God. thought. Come on. You did, you, you did your homework, and you were there to save the day, and it would have been epic. Yeah. Like you always. I think I would have yeah. been all right. You would have nailed it. The Toto guys thought I nailed it. Yeah. yeah. Tim McGraw, I nailed Tim McGraw with no rehearsal. Uh, Great. I do these things. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I did, you know, everyone just knows me because I'm the guy that plays with Jason Aldean for 20 years. But during that journey, we say yes to a lot of things. We go oh, yeah. and we do those things. And thank, thank God we, you know, uh, we, we can chart stuff out. We know our styles. We go, we do our homework. We have a firm handshake, a smile on our face. We go and we meet new people. We do it. Yeah. We have a great time. Yeah. They benefit from it. We grow from it. It's a great thing. It really can, is. Can we talk about that firm handshake? Yeah. <laughs> the firm handshake, you got to watch that one. The firm handshake. Can't be overly, overly firm. firm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that our age. Hands for a little. Yeah, you know, these days. Oh, when some guy goes, yeah, yeah! I'll put the beat, you're like, dude, I'm a drummer. Hello. Yeah. You gotta I watch. can't play tonight. You got to do about like two or three PSI. Oh, the pressure? Yeah. Is that a third of it? That's oh, like, it's like, 
the proper handshake. You, you can't. You can't do it. You can't do that. That's a wet. Yeah, that's a. Well, you got Andy Newmark. You got to come. You got to come to the party. Like you got to get the thumbs there. Right? Yeah, and, and get in. Good. That's a good go. lesson. That's a good, nice. That's a good. Don't crush the guy. No. Because then he can't play. All right. You're gonna crush Roger Federer. Uh, you know. Yeah. No. Hey, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Get this guy's number. Yeah. David, <laughs> any um, any uh, parting <laughs> wisdom or advice for someone coming into the music business kick, these kick days? Watch the brownies. these days. Yeah. Okay. So we got a young musician. They're 18 right, yeah, years old. Serious. This is good stuff here. Uh, you know, and this could also be, because you've got a lot of wisdom. Yeah. And this could be advice for anyone that wants to do anything in life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we've got some perspective now. Yeah. I'm 62, by the way. Yeah. I'm not a young man. No, great, man. really? You look yeah. great. You now, look feeling really terrific. Music Thank is you. a... Um, it's a young man's game. It is. And it keeps... I had you pegged for like early 50s. Oh, yeah. I'll be honest. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, advice for uh, any musician or any anyone, I guess, would be uh, find out what it is that you want to do. Now, I'm, I've had dreams to become something else, you know, that is not this. Right. I've, I've had, I wanted to be a writer at times. I wanted to write. Like prose and stories? Yeah. Well, you're yeah. a good storyteller. I, you I, really I, are. I, I, thank you. I, I write lyrics and things. Mm -hmm. I've wanted to do that, and I've always thought in the back of my mind someday I'd write a book, and you know all these things. And you're branching out, you're acting. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know, and I've seen you. This is definitely your, a book, though, and, for you. And this, oh my gosh, I'm thinking books, I'm thinking things. I mean, I left out a lot of stories. I got twenty or thirty more like this. Yeah, yeah. you had stories from the road. Man. But if it's okay guess, with you the artist, you have your own podcast. Yeah, I if got it's okay with I the artist, tell. you should write this stuff down. Yeah, yeah, you know, if they're okay with it, good stuff. Speaking of your, I mean, I know you want to get to the advice, but That's what's okay. really intriguing me is that you said you're 62. Yeah. Do you have a Native American descendancy? No. Interesting. Santos. My father was from Spain, mm -hmm. and he moved to America, and uh, his father moved here first. He was a little boy, actually, when he came here. That's right. So, mm -hmm. And they, they were rolling cigars uh, with no paper in them. They were actually just the leaf. Mm -hmm. Wow. Just much healthier. Then they started putting in that crappy stuff. So now you get like cancer of your mouth and throat. right. But in those days, it was just you could smoke cigars, probably you know, pretty good. Anyway, they that's what they did. My father smoked a cigar. He he passed away from cancer. Mm. Sorry, it was a sorry to hear that. Sorry, man. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. But that was you know eighty six, mm. and that's my father was uh, 06 when he sorry passed. To hear that. Yeah. Sorry, man. Yeah. Anyway, get, uh, uh, advice. Find out what you're good at. Uh, that's hard to do because a lot of people don't know that. that self-awareness. Well. Yeah, self-awareness. That's right. And and maybe that comes from loving what you do. Sure. So if you love it, you're probably good at it. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of people love things they're not good at it, though. That's the problem. What if you love it and you're just not good at it? Like, yeah. You know, that actress that's always bothering you and she can't do anything. You can't. <laughs> she's, a, she's a bad actor. <laughs> so bad. There's a couple of people in Spring Hill that advertise on the local pages that, <sighs> yeah, and it's like hey, he's got some, he's got stuff up again, and my <laughs> wife sees it. She's like, "Hey, did you see?" It? I go, "Yeah, I saw it." Oh, yeah. He's just not good. At what he yeah. Does. So, oh. so hopefully you're good at what you love, and yeah. you could turn it yeah, into a back career. To seriousness. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Let's say you want to be something. You want to be something. And how old? What age group are we talking? Any, right? I, it could be any season of someone's life. But you know, a lot of people that listen are like, "Oh, I'm you know, I won't. I'm 18. I'm into I'm, the world. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say you're a young person that's not had a career yet. Right? You haven't really started your right. thing yet. But you love drums. You want to play drums. Yeah. You, like you heard Carmen Apicis kick drum, and it was like, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you okay, so a drum set would be a good move. Yeah. <laughs> get a drum set. Right? Get <laughs> a drum set. Save your paper out money. Save your paper. Yeah. Get the drum set. Now, that's not even a joke, right? Yeah. Paper routes used to pay. These days. <laughs> I had them. I shoveled snow. I raked leaves. All that. I'm I, sure you did. I did it. Then you bought that kit. We bought the kit. Got the blue, blue sparkle snare drum. Did you buy the same kit? Did you buy the Apache kit? No, no. I already had like a uh, a Yamaha cherry red oh, drum set. Yamaha. Yeah. Andy Newmark. Yeah. Ooh, one Tom. The two. Was tom that the one that you took toms. a picture with? Uh, your promo picture. They had. You were, oh, you were a Yamaha player. Yeah. You know, I don't have any 
Yeah, I don't. I never took a picture with a professional picture with that. Drum there was set. one picture I saw of you where you took it like in the Marathon Music Works. I think you had a professional. That was my first professional photo. Dang. Yeah, I took in 1997. 1990 first one. <laughs> That's right. But that was a, that was a Yamaha kit. Yeah. Right? Oh, I yeah, love Yamaha drums. Yeah. You jumped up on stage in a band I was playing, and when you first moved. Your first night to town, I believe it was. Came and sat in? Yes, yeah. at Monel. Mar- at Mar- 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 Yeah. Not wow. Mar-Bulls. You remember Mar-Bulls that? Mar-Bulls is the restaurant. Yes. Jumped up and nailed Your first it. night in town? First you... night. Well, it was, it was like a little Motown gig or something. Were you like, kind of like, let me show you what I'm going to do? Let me no, let's talk about like, that for a minute. Come like, on. Let, let's, yeah. It was probably like, let me play the, this song the best I can. Yeah. Because you Mind can't. You, he had a, he let, already had a dream. He already had gone to college. I'm here. He moved to Nashville. Right. Do you know who I'm going to be? That's that was That's your right. mentality. That's right. I, I, pump, I pumped my chest. I mean, we we had Eddie you Bears had on, and and he was like, "Oh, I knew that you would do it. It was just a matter of time, and yeah. you have to just put your time in." Yeah. And anything you're doing, don't be overly patient. Take the right steps. You know, do the right thing. Don't burn bridges. Cultivate relationships. Be in it for the marathon, not the sprint, and it's gonna happen. That's the that was a really well put. Well, that's yeah. actually a very interesting point. A lot of new people misconstrue time. How much time it's going to take. Especially drummers. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You are loving that today. I, it's, you know, it's timely. All right. Let me talk about drummers real quick. Yeah. Uh-oh. Andy Newmark, Joe Vitale. Mm-hmm. Now, Joe Vitale yes. is a new friend. Uh, I met him. Actually, I met him years he ago. Spoke highly of you teaching too. at the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. That's great to hear. And yep. he's coming in this Absolutely. year to teach at my camp this year. I heard about it. Yeah, yeah he told me. He's I, bad. Where did I see recently an advertisement? He's a for bad that. dude. Yeah. Joe Vitale is a great drummer. Now Joe is also a great piano player and a flute player and a writer and good interesting. Singer. Oh yeah, yeah. He's, oh, a he's a musician's really musician. Really great flute player. Yeah. So and piano player. He plays on some of those CSN it's a records. Multi threat. Yep. Now I played with Crosby, Stills, and Nash. <coughs> Joe and I were, bu- had, were buddies on the road forever. Yeah. Once you're a road buddy with a guy, it's forever. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that bass player, your your your, your guy. Oh yeah, me and Tully. Tully, Tully. Like twenty years. Yeah. You guys gonna be friends forever. Yeah. All right. So Joe, now Newmark is di- is different friendship level because I knew him before I know did anything big or anything right so he was like this mentor and I've always loved his music and you can hear him on the ma- the most amazing records in the world you want to hear some great drumming listen to Sly Fresh in time yeah everybody write that down in time the Sly Stone on the Fresh album Andy Newmark Omar Hakeem told me that was his favorite drum track at one time so anyway so Andy and I are really good buddies, and we're talking about like all kinds of things about drumming. This is advice stuff. And uh, Joe Vitale and I are good friends. Now, this is post-CSN, and I was on the road with somebody, and I called Andy for advice about something, still doing that. And we're talking from some hotel room in the middle of the Midwest. Yeah. I'm talking to Andy Newmark from, in London. And we're talking about something I'm doing. I don't remember exactly what it was, but here we're talking, we're talking, and Joe Vitale's name comes up. You played with Joe Vitale. I said, yeah, I did. Yeah, man, we had a good five-year run. And uh, he's like, Joe Vitale changed my life. Huh. Andy Newmark. Full circle. I said, well, tell me about this. He goes, well, Joe Walsh did a double album, a, a double drums album. And he, liked, <laughs> he seems to like that. Joe Walsh's last tour had Chad Cromwell and Joe Vitale oh, on two it. Two drummers. Two wow. drummers. He likes that. Huh. I don't know why. It's a weird thing. It's a lot of drumming going it's on. It's a lot there. of drumming going on. Yeah. It is. It's, it's hard to do well. <clears throat> All my brothers. Somebody has to take the lead and someone has to paint. Ah. I think. You know, the Doobies, Almond. That's yeah. true too. Yeah, yeah. Do- Oh, that's right. Doobies. Yeah. Well, he said, I said, how did Joe Vitale change your life, man? He said, well, I was doing this gig. The drums were set up. Two, two drum sets. We rehearsed. Willie Weeks was playing bass. It was a great band, of course. Tom Bukovac just got off the road with Joe Walsh. You know yeah, Tom? Yeah. Anyway, so he says, uh, I went over after we finished, we wrapped, and everyone left, but I stayed to screw on my tuning. And uh, I, wa- I was like, because you know you're listening to the drummer you're playing with. Like you said, someone's leading, and you're kind of scoping his thing out, right? So he went over and sat at Joe's kit. I think I don't think Andy would mind if I told the story. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can always take it out. <laughs> we can always take it out. 
Okay. See, this is a drum. This is really a drum podcast, right? It's everything. It's everything. Yeah. We have comedians, authors, really? actors. Yeah. It's just telling good stories. I just okay. happen to be a drummer. Yeah. Me too. Good. Two drummers right here. I know. It's <laughs> awful. <laughs> We're double drumming right now. I don't know if I, I don't know if I would really. I, I guess you could. Yeah, I'm a hobby, hobbyist. I'm not a bro. I was self-aware enough that I wasn't good. I just didn't want well, to. Listen to those creamy pipes, dude. I didn't want to. low down there. I didn't want to have the uh, the, the the life you made. Yeah. It's, a, it's a rough life. Oh, you now, mean, mind you, we make a good living. Yeah. 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 But it's hard. It's really hard. It's hard being on the road. I'd rather just be in my closet with That's a right. microphone. You know what? Voicing Li- stuff. <sighs> naked. Liberty. Naked. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to get dressed to work, Jim. I know. I know. Doesn't matter. So all, all really, these, can we see some of that? No, come on. So I, I, mean, I don't think anybody. Andy see that. Newmark, Joe Vitale. <laughs> oh, Liberty Ken, DeVito. Let me Liberty tell you, Liberty DeVito. DeVito. Yeah. Speaking of your kid and all this stuff, yeah, we're he's talking. crazy. Liberty said, "Liberty had put on his drum head one time." Welcome, Tori, or I love you, Tori, or something. I believe when when she was born, mm-hmm. he was on the road. See, that's sweet. That's the life we lead. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have any kids. I got to meet uh, Lib's daughter, I believe, at a at a at a uh, sticks and skins function. Mm. It was like at Nam. I know that. I she's know an that's actress, a book. right? She's an yeah, actress. she's yeah. an actress. She's done very well. Yeah, I knew her before she was. She's got Chica- Chicago Fire, or Chicago Hope, or Some, yeah, Chicago yeah, MD. Yeah, yeah, she's beautiful too. God, yeah. she's sweet. I love her. He's got three daughters, and I, oh, he's got a new kid too. It's not that new anymore. Anyway, uh, a- Andy goes over to Joe Vitale's kit, and no one's there. And he sits at the kit. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. No, let me go right to Andy's actual words. He says, so I go. I go over to his his drum kit. And I sit down. I'm looking at it. Checking it out. It's bigger than mine. (laughs) (laughs) And he goes, so I put my foot at the pedal and I, I hit his kick drum. Now, mind you, I had just come off of the Sly record. And I was playing 16th note funk. With a real little tight little funky little drum kit, and it was like a real pip, you know, pip, cack, pip, cack, tip, 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 all that shit, and a lot of sixteenth notes. Mm-hmm. That shit. Yeah. And and uh, he goes, so I he hit his kick drum, and it went boom, <laughs> 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 and then, whack, big. Big drums. He said that was it. The next day he went out and changed his whole scene. Yep. He had that real tight, funky little thing going. And then it was like. <laughs> and the fills, instead of doing like, you know, the, the 16th note fills, they were like boom, boom, boom. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's- that, that begs an interesting question. What drum set, as you were, when you were a kid, would you have loved to sit behind? Like whose whose drums would you have loved to actually? Oh, play? Yeah, it was it, Karen Carpenter. It, it, yeah, it was like it was like Carmine, uh, Alex, uh, Stuart Copeland. Which Alex kit? Alex who? <sighs> Alex Van Halen. Halen. Yeah, yeah. No, because he always had the the one whatever one he had during the jump video with all the with tape mirrors on the snare on it? Drum. Yeah, and the, yeah. The, the 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 hoses. And but stuff then like also that. you know uh, Stuart Copeland, all the octobons, and then the the snare drum and all those. Tom's like super yeah. high pitched. Oh yeah, you know. See, like I was, uh, I came up under like Portnoy and Carter Bofer, right? And, uh, but I remember I would love to have sit behind Alex's kid. You yeah. had the chance to do it, and then Carmine had the, the double china, the, 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 yeah. double, the double chinas up there, and the. But same. I mean. You had the chance to sit behind Alex's kit, right? Oh yeah, we did. We did you a tribute it. to Alex Van Halen here in With Nashville. His kit. Yeah, it was great, and I got to play. I'll was it wait. everything? Was it everything that you expected? It was awesome. The kick drums were like, Duh. were they? Bar- yeah, huge. the same kind of thing, right? I mean, yeah. but, but he had two. He has two kick drums like glued together, oh. so it was like, <laughs> oh. yeah, yeah, whoa, yeah, big. What about James Gadson? Sure, man. Neil Pierce. 
<laughs> that guy. I remember seeing, uh, what was it, Neil Peart's kit? Was that one of the- I never had enough drums to, to emulate Neil Peart. Like, you run times. out. You got to go. It starts here. By yeah. the time you get over there, it's no, the I got, next song. I got, I got a four-piece drum You're in the next sound. The and then he had uh, Freddy Krueger. <laughs> you're on the bus already. Freddy Krueger? Fred, Freddy Played Gru- drums? <laughs> I'm Freddy your drummer <laughs> now. <laughs> Freddy Krueger came in and, and, and taught Neil, Jeez. and it became more spiritual. So his snare uh, drums is, is uh, belly button level now. Yeah. Spiritual, the, yeah. You know and, they and say Neil started it, it, playing it, traditional grip. It's supposed to emanate from the belly button area. Yeah. So I think that your your you know your advice for people in life is about the same as mine, which is find your passion, mm. go with it, mm. yeah. work at it every day, never stop. But understand yeah. that loving a music man ain't always what it's supposed to be. You see, yeah. the reality comes in. That's right. We have the two dreamers and the reality person. It's like circus <laughs> life under the big top world. We all need the clowns to make us laugh. Oh my God, you are so poignant. That's right. Poignant? Yeah, it's silent G. It's, you don't use the G. Poignant. Yeah. Through, I'm coming up with this a spontaneous. This is a great space. conversation. Through space I think this is a p- perfect time to, to end up. You feel good about it? I'm good. I like it. Fantastic. I think this, of, is, this is the hardest I've laughed at in a long time. I've this got is, more stories. We I can know. do it another day. I we think got the, volume two. The way you tell your stories oh. is epic. It's and hilarious. That, that's okay. what storytelling is all about. Like, you know the punchline is coming. You can almost see the ending coming, but it's the journey. Right. Ain't that the truth? You got a little Jerry Lewis in there, like, like your faces and your expressions. I know, very yeah, expressive. I can do it. I can, hey, man, I could be a comedian. That was what they say. I told you I wanted to do something else. You ever thought about doing comedy? comedy. Stand-up comedy. Yeah, stand-up comedy. You could make a whole 45-minute act out of one story. Really? Yeah. What if I wasn't funny? Well, well that's try it on. It's got to be in there somewhere. Some yeah. laughs. Yeah, they got to. If they're not laughing, it's over. The marijuana stories is in and of itself would be. But you can't tell minutes. it every night. But yeah, that's the thing is that, you know, but every, two. but it's like playing a, a song. Okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like every time these guys get up and they do their their bits, their comedy acts, it's the same thing over and over. No, yeah, what, what, I like see with, thing. what I see with David is less stand-up comedy, maybe more a one-man show. You have, yeah. your, you have your base. Okay. You tell stories and then you have some multimedia behind you. Yeah. And you do little theaters. Oh my and God. it's a one-man show for the guy that played bass behind... Right. Let me just say this about that. Nobody cares. No, the, it's a, the one man show. I would show up. I know me and Brian Delaney would come. Oh. Lib would come. Joe Vitale Listen, would man. come. Yes. You know, every time I take a bass solo on a jazz gig, people walk out. Why is that? It's like. Is it me or the bass? Bathroom time. I don't know. I played with a guy. It's, <laughs> it's bathroom time. You played with a guy? When? I, play, I played with a guy in uh, mid 90s. I love playing. He was, the, he was the bass player, Sandy Nardone. Yeah, he was big. He used to wear uh, medical tape on his fingers for the thumping. Oh, he did a lot of that oh, stuff. Oh man, uh, you there's know a guy named I mean, Jody was, Nardone in town. Yeah, Jody he was great. He was keyboard player. Awesome. The, the only thing Sandy. bad about popping and slapping is. Mm-hmm. Great, you have the technique together, but when it's out of time and it's uh, not feeling good, why are you doing oh, that? It's so bad. Ferroni told me one time. By the way, Steve Ferroni is one of my best friends. I, I gotta say, you got a lot of drummer friends. He's one of my best friends. Yeah. Oh, dude, that makes Steve. sense. He's so great, man. He told me one time they did a rehearsal and the bass player came in, played beautifully, just right, and. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first two hour episode until he started popping and slapping <laughs> exactly are you a popper and a slapper no, no. I, I you, listen you can do if, it. If I was known for that right. I was actually known for that believe it or not a lot of people won't it won't say this but I actually was and people would yeah. call me and I played <clears> on some TV <throat> themes and things in New York yeah Fox News theme Seinfeld. Tron matized. There's some things like that. I yeah. played slap. They'd call me for that. They really did. It was Marcus Miller and Will Lee era, and I was in that crowd and all that trying to be that. Yeah, so I did that. But then rock and roll came along, and it was more a lot more about playing simpler and, and things. Not that rock and roll came along, but I started getting those gigs. Yeah. Yeah. But what was I going to say? I was. Gonna You're talking about something, Steve something funny. Your Ferroni own. said, yeah. "Yeah, yeah." He said something about, uh, "Yeah, he played great at rehearsal. It was great. It was fucking great." And then when he got to the gig, he started slapping and popping all over the place. And and he said, excuse me, what what is all, what is all, <laughs> you didn't do that. It's, Did you have it's, Rice Krispies before you came here? Snap, crackle, pop, <laughs> grind, oh my God. You don't need all that, I don't think. You know, some people do, but yeah. not, you when I did it, okay, I was going to make a movie. I, I'm still making it, and I have lots of clips, and I've got a lot of people in it. 
I really should have you. It's just like a discog- uh, a uh, uh, it's got documentary. A yep, yep. It was going to be David Santos alive in music. I have all the footage. I've That's got great. a lot of stuff. Yeah, so you're like yeah. forget the book. I'm doing a documentary. Dude. Oh man, but no one it was interested. But I've not finished it because it's, it goes over the course of like quite a few years. And so I did Ferroni. I did an interview and I brought in my camera at his house. Yeah, and we did a thing. He was lovely and he said, uh, "I said, what do you like in a bass player?" And he said, "They're inobtrusive." There you have it. So, it, <laughs> yeah, you, sometimes you don't notice a bass player until they miss a you note. You don't notice them. That's and right. And that's beautiful. That's what he loves. He doesn't want to hear all that nonsense. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry that it... I don't mean that it's nonsense. I know a lot of I guys mean, make a up, living do that. They're doing that. Lock up with my right foot and create a bed with me. Where it's a team. team. Unless you're Primus. Yeah, see, that's what he, he probably uh, wouldn't yeah. go less for Claypool. that sound. Yeah. He so, would want much less. Of Claypool. So, David, are you um, on social media? Can people find you? How do the people find you? DavidSantos.com, right? Yes. And then... <laughs> you can get me on Facebook, yeah, too. Yeah, a little Facebook action. A little bit. I think he's I might on, start phasing that down a little he's more. He's on Friendster. Well, you, you got this documentary coming out. Could be a Netflix thing, man. Yeah. Friendster? Is that a dating site? <laughs> what is that? Friendster was a uh, social media It was like a precursor to MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> Totally crazy. Is MySpace still up? It I is. I mean, it's somewhere there. Is there music on it? He and I met on MySpace. Yeah, we did. Really? Other, otherwise, it would have been on Tinder. Tinder. Ouch. I knew you were going to say that. Come on, guys. Get it right. Grinder. Grinder. Yeah. Grinder. What's that? I'm sorry. I don't know. It's, 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 uh, I don't know. It's a male male dating site. I don't know. It's David, davidsantos.com. Yeah, you can say yeah. that, but I, you know, I don't really check it, honestly. Everyone's you know, got a hot got, got a dot com, but it always is like I was checking Chris McHugh's website because he, he's coming on the show. Man, I love Chris. Supposed to be on today. He's got tour dates today. on from two thousand nine. Oh, we yeah. never yeah. update our I mean, websites. Who does? Yeah, <laughs> we never update. You've got to come see me, man. Come see me at two thousand and nine. <laughs> I didn't How know do I even Hill there. had his own website? It's crazy. I had a little band with Chris. Yeah, it didn't last long, but I loved playing with him. He was on one of my first sessions. Yeah. Oh man, I know you got to say it. I got to. Yeah. I go. T- Come on. What? Never mind. This will be on the episode two. I episode two. We're gonna say, Part my two. gosh, we got to bring him back like five times. Yeah, there's a whole bunch. Yeah. Chris was on one of my first sessions. Like you, when you came in and jammed with me like that, I yeah. walked in and Chris was playing drums. Yeah. And the guys, and I looked at the number chart and I went, huh? Yeah. And the guy said, these are, not, these are numbers like one, two, three. There's no bar lines. I, I know, but you, you look, when you, okay, look, you underline it and then there are two pieces, pieces and if you want to do a push, you, you put a little check mark there and then it's kind of push one, two, and three. And got it? He gave me the whole- You right learned now. the national number yeah. system on a session yeah. like I did. <laughs> yeah. 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 You can learn it quick. Boy, quick as hell. But you can't really do it, even though you're looking at it and thinking all those thoughts while yeah. you're playing it. So Chris just was like, play by ear, play by ear. He had knew, known some of my history, the Billy Joel stuff, and he was like, I like this guy. He was encouraging you. Yeah. To get through that session and learn the Nashville number system on your own time. And then later he said to me, not he, the producer, David, <laughs> you're going to have to stay after school on this one. Next tune. Okay, so come back after the recording session, come back and overdub that yeah, one. Yeah, fix gotcha. it because you're not reading these number charts. Now, years later, I went to a, a party after a big session, all A guys. It was right. a giant, like all these badasses, right? All these session, you know, aces. You know who they are. Sure, yeah. And at the head of the table was, you know who he is. And we're all there. And Tom Bugavex, my buddy, is sitting across from me. And this guitar player to my left was on that first session that I couldn't read the number chart. Right. And Tom Bugovac, God bless him, this will be my final story, <laughs> he has the, he has the <laughs> wine glass and he has a little ding, 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 silence, and he goes, to David Santos, the only guy I've ever played with that when he hits one note, you know who it is. Oh, wow. That's awesome. What a great thing so, to say. So, Cheers, I, bud. I, I go to start to drink. Gonna, yeah, I love this. We We're go. acting it out. And that's what... And I go to say... Hey, no, stop. A counter toast. A counter toast? A counter toast. Oh, no. The guy who was at the session stood up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love this storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I look up at him, he's sitting right next to me, towering over me. They really take that stuff seriously, that number system thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 He held up his glass. 
and everyone's <laughs> yeah but he was on the first session I did he did in town here and he couldn't read a number system chart and it pissed me off <laughs> and then it was a counter toast it was a counter toast was there a third toast he slandered me in a like counter toast it's like a debate it was over and, but he was sitting right next to you then he sat plopped right back down and drank it's like, okay, and everybody's, everybody's uncomfortable now. Yeah, that sucks. Well, Tom tried. Yeah. He tried. Guys, hey. that's a, that's probably a great place to wrap up yeah. here. That this, was negative. Let's step on a quick, let's do yeah. a quick positive. Something this positive. Good positive. Hey, come on. Let's do positive. Okay, happy. Get on the kid <laughs> stuff. Get on come the on. kid over there, man. Grab that bass. Slap at the bass. Oh, uh, 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 okay. Uh, Keith Carlock moved to town. Yeah. That's positive. Oh, that's very there you positive. Go. positive. There you go. Good stuff going on. Huh? Come on, what else? <laughs> you might got? try that comedy thing. <laughs> you probably should, man. This was a, a fantastic Thank episode. You. Definitely our Love longest you, episode because it was filled with great storytelling, great Thank takeaways. You. I don't have any advice for anybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> do whatever you have to do. <laughs> Guys, check out davidsantos.com. Just be creative. Keep in touch with us. Thanks so much for subscribing, sharing, rating, and reviewing. Keep coming back here for the good stuff. This has been another episode of The Rich Redmond Show with my co-host Jim McCarthy. We'll Jim, see you next Jim, time. Jimmy. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.